live because I don't know how to do the video. So we're live. <laughs> I'm not Michael. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, hello, everybody. <laughs> no, we were just trying to figure out how to make it do the countdown. We don't know how to do it with Michael. No, tonight. there is no countdown tonight. There's yep, no, just, typically no countdown to destruction, right? It just kind of happens. Just popping up. Yeah, that's what we're rolling with right now. But how's everybody yeah. doing tonight? Good? Doing well. Doing well. Michael's on his way to pick up his daughter and um, on their that long hike that they're doing on the Appalachian Trail. Mm -hmm. So he's not joining us tonight. But what did he mm -hmm. say? Is something insane like 2,200 to 300 miles or something like that? Yeah, a lot more than I wanted to do. Yeah, I don't have that level of commitment in me. I'm sorry. And getting this time of year, it's cold. That's for sure. So dealing with that at night in the campground and the campsites, I suppose, not even campgrounds. Mm-hmm. So uh, you guys probably don't know Ryan yet. This is a uh, chirpy off AVS forum, and he's one of the old guard from the Kansas City AVS group. So he's gone to a lot of the different shootouts and comparisons that we've done over the years and been a great asset to our local community. So he's got a fantastic home theater coming together. And some of the time tonight, we're going to donate to that so he can kind of walk through his build and what he's putting together. And uh, we might as well start off the night, fellas, with our Tremors discussion. So I hope everybody did their homework and watched the Tremors movie. We can see where we landed on that. Does it hold up well, guys? What'd you think? Chirpy, did you think it held up well? Well, the funny thing about it is it's one of those movies that even when it was the 80s or you watched it in the 80s and the 90s, it wasn't the kind of thing that you actually, it was never believable. And that was never the point, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I think it still holds up great simply because it's, it's a... Uh, like some movies, they know what they're aiming for and they don't hit it. But this is one of those movies that it's, you know, it's a B movie. It knew it was a B mm -hmm. movie when they made it. I know famously Kevin Bacon fought tooth and nail to try to not be in it. And now he's so grateful that he basically lost to himself. Right. Because yeah. I, I, I actually thought it was pretty fantastic. Yeah. I watched it in 4K HDR. Yes. I, I heard that it had like fantastic 4K HDR. Did you guys, did you watch it that way or did you watch it in a Blu-ray copy? HDR. I yeah, feel I like it wasn't it as good of a transfer as some of the old movies that I've seen that have transferred over, but it was it was it was good. I mean, it was still fun. The the hues coming out of the monsters, the guts, the orange guts and stuff were fun. And I feel like it, it had maybe like uh, especially in like the early scenes, maybe with all the rock and rubble, it sticks out more, but almost like a tad artificial sharpness sprinkled mm -hmm. in there. But maybe that's just my imagination. Yeah, I thought so a little bit of that too. A little bit of graininess in some scenes. Um, it looked really good though. It was fun. The the sound was not up to modern standards by any stretch of the imagination. The vocals sound a little canned. Um, there was no Dolby Atmos or anything. It was upmix DTS MA is the way I watched it. So full surround system upmixed. But one thing I noticed that I haven't, I probably only watched that on TV before to be quite frank. So I'm watching it in the home theater. Did you guys notice it? I don't know. Did you watch it in your home theater? Did you watch it on a like a small screen? Um, I watched it on uh, the, the screen behind me, and that's about 106 inches. It's the baby theater that's satiating me in the meantime. Sure, with full surround and everything? Yeah. So did you notice every time the Tremor monster happened that there was kind of like a bionic man type sound coming out of the right front wide or front speaker? Either one, I couldn't really, I didn't place it and go put my ear Almost like, to, I don't know, almost like like tinny echoey kind of thing? Yeah, like a type thing. And right. It was always out of the right side. I was kind of thinking like, that's odd that they would only place it in the right speaker. But mm. re repetitively every time. So some interesting, I don't even think I've ever noticed that. Like, you know how Jaws has a theme every time the shark shows up? Well, that Tremors monster has a theme too, but. Yeah, and you know, and in, in some ways you mentioned Jaws. This actually has something in common with that, where I feel like the limitations of its time played in its favor all these years later, right? Like with mm -hmm. Jaws, the shark was always breaking down while they're trying to film it, I think. Um, <laughs> right, uh, and so they had to show less of it. And mm -hmm. when you have to show less of it, you have to get creative in what you do show, right? Mm -hmm. it's actually um it's it's one of those things where uh, they used in that movie it's like the trimmer cam i would call it right mm -hmm. it's not just it's it's not just the stuff where like the dirt's peeling away underneath but literally it's just somebody with with a steady cam and they're marching it on the ground towards somebody but mm -hmm. in some in some ways um it's it's uh the fact you can't see it right it's like uh it makes it i think a little bit more effective in that especially if, with the b movie uh 1950s homage thing going on you're calling this a b movie this is straight a list <laughs> it is it, it's it's straight a b i don't know what else to call it <laughs> or as turpy said off camera it's adorable yes it's it's adorable, <laughs> adorable. Now, there, is, 
Are, is, are, are I we, like how much like rates when I do that. Adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Like Ryan's got two levels, right? And by the way, we're referring to me as only <clears throat> chirpy. Uh, let's simple. make that clear to keep this simple. But Ryan's got two levels, like like Mel holding it back here and eat the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I need to put a um, a filter on so it doesn't go over the top. It's probably necessary. Anyway, I thought of you as one point in particular, Ryan, uh, when we went shooting the other day. Did you notice that when what's his Bert, what was his name? Gums something the the main guy with the guns. I don't even know. No, I Gun think it was guy. Bert, wasn't it? Bert, I, I think I it was Bert. Know. Any rate, Michael he, Gross's did, character. I know the when he shot the, the elephant gun. Did you notice how he was holding it? <laughs> I had to laugh. That thing would have yeah. ripped his arms off. He didn't even yeah. have it, the butt of, the rifle against his shoulder. It was like the butt of the rifle was underneath his armpit, and he's holding it like he this. Should have held it. Like, like even if you shoot clay pigeons properly, like you shoot like ten of those, and you're gonna feel it in your shoulder the next day. Oh man! Oh yeah. And that's with just it's just with that kind of a gun, let alone what that thing's supposed to be. Yeah, that thing. Yeah. Uh, that I watched like uh, a bazooka. Or I watched an episode of that rifle. <laughs> I watched the episode of that beast, the weightlifter from Britain. And he was shooting those big weapons off and got to the elephant gun and it was throwing him around. You know, he's a 350 pound giant of a man. And I was thinking if that thing had a proper round in it and he's holding it like that, it's just going to like break his arms. But, mm -hmm. oh, well. This is fun. I, there you I, go. I from the it, chat, Bert Gummer. I only watched it on a, um, on a 42 inch display. Oh. So... But 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 how close were you sitting? I mean, I'm sitting two feet. So yeah, see, you know, so kind of the same experience. Mm. Kind of, kind of, not really at all. <laughs> but however you want to think about it. Uh, so do we? What do we think about the movie? I honestly think it's the kind of movie that uh, I would be happy to go to bat for it and like sort of like force my family and friends to experience it at least once it's like i think it's definitely good enough for that right mm -hmm. so um and i sort i ran out of time to you know force my family to watch it my wife is impossible to watch anything that has remotely scary elements to it like literally uh, we've been like married for like tw over two decades and it was like year one we watched a korean horror movie and, and we haven't watched anything since we like watched it in the middle of the night and then she made me, and it was a really badly done ripoff of I Know What You Did Last Summer. I forget what it's called. It's like Nightmare or something. So uh, we had to turn on all the lights after it was over. It's 2 a.m. And then she made me watch Happy Gilmore. And then, and that was a work night. And then we left the lights on for two weeks thereafter. And we haven't watched anything remotely scary ever since. So unfortunately, <laughs> I if we, if I watch anything that's remotely like that, it's either with my daughter or uh, and me, and it, or it's alone. I, I don't have the zoo station over there that Jonathan does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, about that, that's kind of funny that your wife watched one horror movie. My, when I got married, my wife said she wasn't afraid of scary movies at all. And then we watched one in the theater. It wasn't this theater, but at the time, that totally changes the perspective. Because when she says she wasn't scared of horror movies, she was watching on like a 19-inch TV. When you got a full-size projector screen and the full surround sound and everything, those jump scares are a little bit more intense. That so, reminds uh, you totally. That actually reminds me of something my wife was talking about the other day. We were watching uh, the movie Kubo and the Two Strings, and there's this one scene in the movie where there's the two sisters that appear across the lake, mm -hmm. right? And they're sort of like taunting him from afar, asking about what happened to his eye, and they're coming to collect the next one as they float across. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how much that scene just freaked her out. And then she talked about how she watched it uh, somewhere else just in passing. It was on a TV or whatever. She said it wasn't scary whatsoever. And it was all in the presentation. First one was in my first theater room that I had built. You know, like there's like, there's like those low frequency rumbles that make oh, this, yeah. the room shutter like, like Pulse is famous for like those super ultra low Pulse bases movies. And, and uh, a projector sort of creates the, uh, for it to look good, creates the perfect environment for a horror movie. It's got to mm -hmm. be dark. It's got to, mm -hmm. you want all the soundproofing around you. It's, it's like you want all the isolation. Mm -hmm. And then now you're going to traumatize yourself. So it's perfect. <laughs> yes. My wife fell asleep during Alien. What? 
in your theater room or on a TV? It was on a TV. She'd fall asleep in the theater room too. I don't know, man. Yeah, she would. In the last five years, I showed Aliens to my mother-in-law, and enough. she was like jumping out of her skin yeah, <laughs> down there in the theater room. I don't know. My she would definitely would not watch Tremors because it looks too old. <laughs> I uh, I think that's an indoctrination while you're young kind of thing. This, that's uh, why it looks adorable. Well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Um, like uh, I've been going through like a uh, I've got a Google Sheets with my daughter, and I have like a, a must watch list, and she picks something once in a while and texts me and it's like, hey, tomorrow night can we watch this one? Can we watch that one? So I'm sort of like forcing the classics on her. And I feel like uh, if you've sort of uh, watched the classics when you were younger, whatever the classics were at that age, right? Because that always shifts. It's like, you know, the classics yeah. when I was young were the 60s and 50s. And the classics when my daughter's, you know, 14, 15, 16, we're talking about the 80s and 90s comparatively. Sure. It makes me, it makes me feel ugh inside, but it is what it is. And so, uh, like, she, you know, so she sort of, like, gets the limitations and in some way appreciates things that she look, that, that she's looking for. Uh, like, the other day, she went uh, with some of her friends to, uh, to the university. You know, they're always having those, like, like, retro movie nights or whatever. They had Little Shop of Horrors uh, with Rick Moranis movie. You know, giant puppet that's nothing but practical effects. She loved it. Right. Mm -hmm. So and it doesn't bother her at all. It doesn't look as real as possible. Right. So I think I think it's just sort of like a mindset you have to get into at a certain time in order to be able to appreciate those things in other ways. Hmm. Yep. What should we watch the next one next? Do we have to go to Tremors too? <laughs> Dude, do you know how many they, they made seven like of those? Five. There's seven. Made, there's seven. Oh I'm, I looked it up. I didn't know they made seven of them. That's that's awful. It's like the <laughs> Walking Dead of animatronic well, horror movies. To be fair, though, I mean, can you think of a movie franchise by the time they, well, maybe Harry Potter they were, but that's a little bit different because that had the story sort of like, the, you the know, uh, were they good by then? No. That's my point. <laughs> Oh, no. oh, we were making them good as they got better, as they more. Movies yeah, that's why out. I was. That's why they, I think maybe the Harry, Harry Potter, Potter series was then. Yeah, 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 Harry Potter. Potter but, absolutely. But, but the difference between the Harry Potter series, though, and something like Fast and the Furious, is that's something where they, you know, like they finished it and they have no idea what's coming next, and then they finish it and they have no idea what's coming next, that, and they Fast finish and it. Furious isn't even remotely the same movie as when they first came out. Right. So, um, same thing as Trimmer Seven, I'm sure. <laughs> We should all watch Trimmer Seven now. Let's and skip one, go straight to seven, right? <laughs> straight to seven. Was it, I think it was Stephen again. King. It was Stephen King who famously said, "If you want to write, learn how to write a good novel, you need to read a bad one. You'll learn more." <laughs> so let's go check good out point. Seven. So what should we do for the next movie? Any recommendations? Do we really do Tremor Seven? Where do you even find Trimmer Seven? I don't even know. Like, was that, that might... direct to DVD or VHS? Oh, I'm sure it's 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 like they created it just for the DVD bargain bin at Walmart. It's probably fifty percent of their revenue. Tremors Seven, Tremors Shriek. I. It came out in 2020. Yeah, that's what? not that old. Yeah, no. no. Thirty or forty year story right. career here. With we the have to watch guys. this. I think this has to be the next one. This is one way to waste a life, I'm sure. This is one way to waste every viewer's time. I I watched through the fourth one, I think, and they were pretty bad by then, so I can only imagine what's happening. But I'd like three. to do a compare and contrast. I mean, I think it'd be interesting to just watch them back to back and see what... Burt Gummer is in this one. Still. 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 Oh, wow. But you gotta I, I just the ruined clock. the entire series for somebody. All right, I can commit to watching Trimmer 7. I'm committing. <laughs> I don't even know how I'm going to get it, but what is it on? Uh, got to order from what it's on. The I'll just be thrilled Michael's back and I'll be like, "Oh yeah, I watched it. I'll comment offline." <laughs> Streaming. It's like you can rent it from a lot of places for 4 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Can I watch it on Prime TV? Prime Video? No. <laughs> I'll just have to rent it. This is going to be awful. Oh, boy. But we'll find out. I mean, it's not the worst rated movie. What's its Rotten Tomatoes score? Oh, oh boy. 
It's rated it's 5. Kaleidos- on DB. They have it on Kaleidos. They have it on Kaleidoscape. You should get it, my Ryan. No. No. <laughs> 44% okay. percent on run. Yeah. So that's not the worst. I mean, there's been some zeros, haven't there? And this is 40. This might be a masterpiece in comparison. I like Speed Racer, and that had like a 40%. So you yeah. never know. This could be one of our all time favorite movies now. All right. Speaking of, you just said Speed Racer had bad reviews, but you liked it a lot. What's your favorite notoriously panned movie that oh, everyone wow. else hated that you loved? Oh, man. I got to look at my Plex server. I don't know if it was panned across the board, but I have a really soft spot for Dune 84. I've never seen that. It's you. If you watch it now, you are not going to enjoy it. <laughs> but mm. uh, if nothing else, the pro- a lot of the production design is pretty crazy amazing. There's some pretty amazing practical effects they did for that movie too. Um, like... Um, they literally for this like if you look at like some of the model work some of it doesn't hold up but some of it looks amazing with some of the worms where they literally used micro glass beads for the sand because if they used regular sand the grains are too big and the scale doesn't work Mm -hmm. but as a result everybody on set had to wear like crazy respirators otherwise this is glass that would get into your lungs and cut it up Mm. so but all sorts of fun stuff like that they pulled off for that movie my my little pleasure that nobody else liked would be uh, 13th Warrior. It had a 33% on Rotten Tomatoes, but I absolutely love that movie. It's one. It's in my top five. I don't know why I like it so much, but I really do. Have you guys seen that one? I don't think so. I, 13th I think Warrior. I is that Antonio, Antonio Banderas? It is. Okay. Back in his heyday, 1999 time frame, if I remember right. Yeah, yes. that would have been like his From Dusk to Dawn heyday, right? Mm-hmm. I'm mm. terrible at remembering movies, so I don't really know what mine would be. Um, probably some, probably something like Mystery Men. <laughs> I liked Mystery Men too, but did that oh, get man. badly rated? You shovel what? better than any man I've ever known. <laughs> Mystery Men. I got to uh, think that one rated high. Sixty percent. That's too high. Well, that's too high. Too high to count. Um, I don't even know. Trying to think of movies that if I saw it on, I would sit down and watch it. Mm. That really is a tricky one, right? Because you want to put something out there that at the very least people won't ridicule you for. <laughs> mm. I mean, you guys, how, I don't even know. We can stick with the Trimmer 7 thing for next week. But if you guys haven't seen 13th Warrior, we got to watch that and see what you guys think. Because I that's such a good movie to me. I don't know why people hate it. I loved it. Couldn't tell you. I liked it. I'm Logan's still trying run. To... Somebody doesn't like Logan's run was popular. I'm looking in the comments here. Wasn't that a that was a well rated movie, was it not? I enjoyed that one too. That one is rated sixty percent. So that's yeah, that's not a that's something no one hated on that one too much. Hmm. I would think more in the vein of this, you know, like like demolition man or or the stallone version of dread or over the top or what else is an awful movie i'm gonna look up what was due 1984's rating 44 percent on rotten tomatoes but do you think that's gone art down because of the new movies that have come out well, here's the thing with Rotten Tomatoes. It depends on the movie. Some of those, they actually went back and found all the old reviews and did like almost like archive dump reviews to pad how many reviews are in there for some movies. Mm-hmm. So it's actually really fun. You can look up like movies like like uh, Gone with the Wind and uh, Casablanca or whatever, a few movies that, of that age, and they will have original reviews of when they came out. And some of them are hilarious on like from a historical standpoint how badly their perceptions on certain things uh, aged, right? So it just sort of depends on the movie if it was padded uh, one way or the other. So and, and and maybe that makes it harder to compare too, right? It's like, well, some people saw this when they were younger, like original Star Wars 77. Um, when you see that at eight years old uh, back then versus, you know, 40 years old now, it just hits mm-hmm. different. How, co- how could it be anything but that? So... Some of mine are going to be things like Space Jam. 
Oh wow, that was rated well, wasn't it? You no, can't do that one. Let me look. That no, it, it better not have been. Well. <laughs> that thing was nothing but selling lunch boxes. Yeah, that's what that then, movie was. My real one that I like, that I think most people will hate, is Wild Wild West. Came out in wow. 1999 with Will Smith. Space Jam was a 43. Wasn't uh, Wild Wild West famously the movie that Will Smith took instead of The Matrix? Because the Wachowskis blah, 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 wanted him first. That was their first pick was Will Smith, and he went to a different movie. I don't know. It's a 16%. Yeah, you might have won the, the worst one there with 16%. Right? I'll watch it every time it's on, though. But <laughs> I don't think I've totally seen Wild bad. Wild West. I've seen it's, clips of it. It's really bad. Animal crawls. Oh, the audience doesn't like that one. They're that sucked, Ryan. So <laughs> <laughs> finally, some honesty is kicking in. Somebody in Tron, here mentioned um, you said Tron Legacy was bad. That was a I, great one. I love that movie. That I like that movie a lot. It, actually, when I first saw the movie, I thought it was that movie. Is sort of the same thing that happened to me when I saw The Fifth Element. When I first saw it, mm. I was like, it was fine, I guess. And then for some reason. It was always on wherever I was going. <laughs> and like I'd see it a second time, a third time. And in each subsequent viewing, I was like, I would like pick something up or just tend to enjoy some other aspect about it or whatever. And Tron Legacy is totally one of those movies that, you know, it was like, you know, it was like it was like a C plus the first time I saw it. Now it's like a solid B plus for me for some reason. It just it held up better than I thought as I kept on watching it. And it's probably got the best 7.1 soundtrack ever. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be up there. It up mixes agree. so well too. And I would love, I know that they shot that movie 2K, like the cameras they shot it with were 2K. So there it's not possible to have a true 4K master of it. But I would take uh uh an AI 4K uh, uh upscale. Like a hybrid. And, and a hybrid and it, with an eight if if there's any movie that would be such a fun HDR recoloring. Uh, re remapping that's the movie there's a fan mm -hmm. version of it that looks pretty incredible but i would love to see an official shot at that have you guys seen this one final fantasy yes. the spirits within yeah i actually I liked really that liked one. that one back in the day I yeah did too. i rewatched it it was bad it was that bad movie was well i think it's because i've gotten more material now to compare it to so there wasn't like all of these anime adaptions or video game movies and stuff when it came out and it's in comparison i think it it's maybe not as good i liked it when it came out yeah i have fond memories of that one i'll have to watch it again and see if it holds up in my opinion that's a that movie almost bankrupted square the the soft the the software developer who made all the fan of final fantasy games they sunk like 140 million bucks in that movie, which is a lot really? now, but it was, it was even more then. They went like, I can't remember what it was at the time. I think it was those SGI workstations that were all the rage. And it did, it just lost a pile of money. So, but it was such an amazing looking film for the time. Nowadays, it wouldn't barely pass muster as, as a cut scene on a portable video game, right? But right. back then, it was a visual wow. Plus, it had Ming Na Wen in it from uh, Mulan, and I like her. I guess that's true. This you're speaking. In? You're speaking to Ryan's heart there. Dread oh, it's a great movie. Your favorite movie or something, isn't it? Dread no. was awesome. It's just Dread, a great movie. Yeah. Now, Dread 2012 is just. A, I feel like that's a good movie. Period. I mean, if you have the stomach for the ultra violence, I understand why some people would be turned off by that. That's totally fair. But if you if you can you know if you can handle the violence, I think that movie's a, it keeps such a high level of adrenaline going for mm -hmm. so much of it. And it's it's uh, it's actually that's something I didn't mention about Tremors. Um, it's not an over. It doesn't wear out its welcome. Right. Like Tremors is like a 95 minute long movie, 96 that's minutes true. long. And movies nowadays, like like uh, for all the problems that Marvel movies have, it was just weird to see people start saying, oh, the new one coming out is only an hour and 45 minutes long. Therefore, it's going to suck. I'm like, there's a lot of reasons why a movie is going to suck. But it's kind of a bummer that people would assume that a shorter, tighter edited mm -hmm. movie would necessarily be a bad one so they need to bring back the shortened movies they're all so long now which i guess makes it more money yeah uh, i'm not this sure where that mentality happened like like literally they all have to be marvel yeah maybe 
they got longer and longer and longer and the fan service kept increasing 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 and then the, everything's long now i don't know what can you do should we jump into our topic one more we've, we've decided on oh, congo. congo oh my gosh i'm What's not gonna rating, jonathan i i, I love the good. book the movie was not i good. read the book yeah i unfortunately fell prey to reading the book first too and that's <laughs> always a tough row for mm -hmm. a movie because the movie always has to compete with what your imagine came imagination and came up with. So in your mm -hmm. imagination, this place looks like this, this person looks and sounds like that. And then you just mm -hmm. run into this cognitive dissonance stuff like the whole time. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Oh man, why'd they change that? Oh, that was a boneheaded thing. And so it's really hard, but Congo in particular, um, Mm. The funny thing is, is we've seen we've all seen all of these movies. <laughs> like I know I that's said, a good point. If I said Anaconda, that I watched that one two or three times in the theater. So that oh one, my god, on me. you're like my grandfather, who's like it's one of his favorite <laughs> movies ever. Why? Why more than once in the theater? I gotta know. It was just it was in high school for me, and some of my oh. different groups of friends wanted to see it. So I was like, "Yeah, I'll go I, get." I, I can't it. laugh. I saw Mortal Kombat, the original one, like five times in theater, mm -hmm. and it's awful. Now go back and watch it. It's really bad. But I don't Mortal Kombat, all, no, no, Mortal Kombat Annihilation is awful. Like you <laughs> got like there's different level there's levels there's to this different <laughs> levels of awful, but it's. It's like the seven layer levels of hell. I mean, it's still in hell. It's just on a different level. Okay. Snakes on a plane. What about Sharknado? I mean, if we're going down that, but those movies are intentionally bad. I mean, they're doing it yeah. for fan service. I don't think the movies that we're naming were actually intentionally bad. Yeah. So what about that string of Kevin Costner cool. movies that didn't take very well, like Waterworld and Postman and some of those things like that? I liked them all, but they didn't get reviewed well. I liked Waterworld a lot, actually. I feel uh -oh. like um, it's it's one of those, yeah. It, <laughs> I and I agree that narratively, it's a mess, right? Uh, where it's like nothing. If you stop to think about anything for two seconds, you're like, why is dirt so valuable and everybody's filthy, right? So <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're like covering yourself in gold leaf everywhere. I don't know. But if nothing else, it's another one of those movies I can at least appreciate the crazy amount of work that went to. I'm a sucker for production design, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like uh, I can't even remember what they uh, what the ships were called. They built two of them. The one that what that Costner's uh, character floated around on, and those things literally worked, right? Like they spent like a half a million on each one, and there's you know there's there's artists out there, there's there's uh, engineers out there, and they are building these things from scratch. And I can at the very least appreciate something like that, right? It's the same way I can appreciate some things about a Michael Bay movie, but there's that's another level. I just love how we have these comments back to back. Waterworld is fantastic. Waterworld is trash. You suck. No, you suck. No, you suck. I mean, <laughs> fair. We we uh we should end this little debate here and we go should. on. I suppose, huh? Yeah, jump into our topic. I think, yeah, I'm, I can only imagine the amount of questions you got queued up already after this whole diatribe. No, not there's too not much. Really them mostly, yeah, commenting no. on stuff. Oh, well, and thank if you God. guys do have any questions, feel free to put them in there and we'll star them and hit them after the topic. But I think today's topic was going back and talking about theater design and build outs and all that. Yeah. Chirpy, you and I are both building new theaters. Nobody's really heard anything about your new one that you're building, except for your AVS thread. Um, yeah, I've actually been pretty, um, other than the AVS forum thread, I don't think I've said a peep about it anywhere. Um, I occasionally mention, I think I've posted about it twice, for example, on my own personal Facebook page. Mm -hmm. But this is something that I've been chipping away at for a while. It's finally being built out in earnest now. But this is something I actually started um, six years ago um, already. It's crazy. Um, no, seven, seven years ago. Now that's when I started on the design and it just turned into those, one of those situations where your wife wants to go walking and then you go walking through a new subdivision and, and then you look at the new houses they're building there. And it's like, Oh, let's just go look at a model home. And then before you know it, she's like, well, that looks nice. In the back of your head, you're like, well, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> so 
but but so long story short, the carrot was uh, you can have a bigger theater room if uh, if we do this. And I'm like, sounds great. Let's go ahead and do that. And it started out the same way most of these things do. You post something on the forum, and you start getting feedback. And, um, and it was a decently sized room at the time. I was looking at about maybe eight and a half feet tall for ceilings and about, uh, you know, uh, 16 feet wide by maybe, uh, 19, 20 feet long. So not the hugest one, but not small either. But then along came, I, I, um, and my family literally has a name for this. It's called post 21. And it's because on post 21 of my thread, uh, Tim McGee, T. McGee is his name, right? Super wicked smart guy. He just pops in every once in a while and drops knowledge like nobody's business. Um, like, and, and then he'll pull rank on you nine times out of 10 if you try to argue. I was like, you start talking about HVAC calculations and they're like, well, it should be this. And he's like, okay, I know you think that I used to engineer systems for train. You got to trust me, right? So it's just one of those kind of guys. So, um, he put this dumb idea in my head. He said, have you ever considered digging out underneath your garage? Uh, he said, I'd put a triple car garage and use spancrete, which is basically giant precasted concrete. They, yep. and they, and they crane them in and they drop them down. Uh, and so what happens is it's strong enough to where it doesn't need supports running underneath it. So uh, you basically have whatever the size of your garage is, is what the size of the room underneath it will be. Right. Mm -hmm. So so what ended up happening, though, that even made this a little bit more unique than some um, builds is the fact that I had a miscommunication with my builder. And what happened, <laughs> this sucks. which 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 and the thing is, I don't completely blame the builder. Right. They do this. It's kind of like if you do the same thing over and over and over again, it's just sort of like you're on autopilot. Whereas the rest of us, we're not building, you know, 20 houses a year or 30 houses a year or whatever it is. So, so you sort of have to, you don't know the unknown unknowns is what I think they call that in a couple different fields. And in my particular case, um, he said, Hey, yeah, you're going to, for your theater room, whatever you want to call it, your concrete bunker, you're going to get 12 feet. Um, you're going to get 12 foot walls, right? So when, uh, I didn't make out the distinction in my head, 12 feet walls. Okay. That means that's how tall the ceiling's going to be, but that's not the case. So what that actually means is it's going to finish at the height that it finishes at is going to vary. And so, um, I ended up losing about a foot and a half off of what I thought it was going to be, which, you know, cry me a river, 10 foot, uh, 10 foot tall ceilings, uh, 10 foot, six uh, inches for a ceiling height ain't bad at all. Right. Um, but I wanted three rows because the, the size of the room went from that previous one that I said to about, um, almost 20 feet wide by, uh, almost 31 feet long. Right. So a 31 foot long room with three rows, um, the more it's just, it's the proportions going to feel really weird. Um, if the ceiling height isn't a little bit taller than what it would normally be. So I ended up um, begging the contractor to dig out an area for where I thought my first row was going to go. And um, they said, no way, man, it's too much work. It'll be too expensive. And he went down the list it, trying to scare me off, right? He's like, look, we'll have to get soil compaction tests because it'll be near the footer of the of walls. We'll have to, uh, see here, dig it down, not just however deep you need it to be. I wanted it 16 to 18 inches additional sunk down, uh, but also far enough to put in um, drainage tile um, uh, for water because that would then be the lowest point of the house. So, uh, so you would actually, and plus you need, you need backfill some of that too. So for the perimeter, it's actually 24 inches down just to gain 17 to 18 inches. It's a minimum of 24 inches down. And then you're going to have to pour that back in. You're going to have to run that to a sump pump that you're going to have to put somewhere in the room. You're going to have to um, find a way to get the concrete pumped in there um, on and on and on and on. And I'm like, fair point. Great. Have a nice day. So I waited for him to finish it, and then I started doing it myself. 
So because you know it's it's uh it's, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of DIY now and then, right? Glutton for punishment. Brand new yeah. house, Jack Cameron out the basement. You got pictures of this? You got to pull yeah, up absolutely. Let me go. Let me pull up the pictures and I can talk about it. Why I, I try to find those real fast. But like uh, so let's see here. I'm gonna just pop up all of these real fast and open a preview, and then I'll just share my screen. Then you can tell me. If you can see what I do, you see what I see. So let's see here. Share screen window. Okay. Do you see what I see? It's here. We're going to add the stage. Here you go. Okay. So I'm going to run through these real fast. Um, just the ones that'll make the most sense to talk about. But uh, let me get a good. Here we are. So I feel like this is as good a spot I need to talk about. So what happened was this is the area that I decided that I was going to have my first row of theater seating. And the thing that sucked is when they were building the house, they I caught them in the middle of this build. They thought that they were going to be putting a metal beam down the middle and then put columns down the middle of the room. So they put in these, if you'll see these right here. Uh, those are footers. So I still remember when I walked in uh, up on the build and uh, I was vis visiting on site and I looked down the pit and the, and the GC general Croc contractor was there and I pointed at him and said, and I was like, what the frickety frack are those? And I'm like, those are pier pours. I'm like, I know what they are. What are they doing there? So, so we had to have a big course correction, unfortunately. So in the end, they had already been poured and they were already cured and there. And so there, I knew I was going to have to not only cut out and jackhammer out this other section, but I knew these were going to be underneath those as well. And they were thick, you know, we're talking, you know, pure pores need to be a minimum 12, 16 inches, depending on the situation. I bought a Hilti jackhammer just for that. And we <laughs> took this thing out in five gallon buckets. I don't have the Holloway that had the full one. But I did the math and it was somewhere between 20, 25,000 pounds of concrete that we took out in five gallon buckets. Mm. So um, it's uh, it's and it was really cold out. That was the other thing that stunk. But we had the neighbors call the police on us because they thought we were doing something illegal. <laughs> they what? thought we were. I, yeah, we literally got a uh, we got we got the city knock on the door and they're like, we have reports going on here. And I like, let me. Chirpy's so, burying a body in his basement. Seriously, or, or, you know, I, I made the joke that I was doing my Andy Dufresne impersonation on Shawshank, trying to get out of the house alive. I found the, I found a perfectly good sledgehammer underneath their slab when they poured nice. the thing. So it was a oh, rubber my. handle. So score, right? But then what I ended up having to do is I had to also jackhammer and score out to a sump pump location at the back of the room, which is where I, I'm going to put, you know, I put uh, basically, uh, it's a sewage basin. It's a little bit... Um, more overkill than uh, what you would have with like a, a normal sump pump because I wanted something a little bit more solid. And I also wanted it to where uh, sump pumps are kind of like air conditioners. You don't want them to be so strong uh, that they turn off and uh, turn on and turn off right away. So they short cycle a lot. So in my case, what I wanted was I wanted a big enough sump pit that would actually collect a fair bit of water before the sump pump would turn on and then it'd run for a little while and it'd stay quiet for a long time. Right. But literally what you do is you I would dig this thing out, drain it out, dig it out, drain it out until, you know, just keep going down. And you can see how like you can see like rock score lines in the soil and the shale going down. This is the so, Triassic period. This is the. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Fossil record. <laughs> so, and I did not run into any graboids, unfortunately. Oh, so Darn. But, but like literally, I like I put a, a sewage, a sewage basin in the in there, drilled the holes and I. Uh, uh, put in a uh, see here. There's the uh, um, drainage pipe right there. I did a four incher, and it's just one of those situations where it just you just have to like suffer the process. There's no way around it. And it was a pretty big size pit by the time it was done. It looks like a flower pot, but that's a five gallon bucket down there. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it was um, it was no bueno. But um, by the you end of pause it, for this question right here. Yeah, what's the question? Do you have construction experience? That's hardcore. So I finished a couple basements before, and I used to own a couple rental properties. I'm down to just one additional one, but I've done a lot of that kind of stuff, right? So like I finished out like this basement that you see behind me. 
like all all this i i did myself like i ran the gas lines i did the electrical i hung the drywall did the framing insulation wood floors all that stuff and most of that stuff i'm not necessarily good at it i'm just patient like if i walk you to my theater room back there i have a little drawing up in the corner and it's a, just a little doodle of an ant and i then i put a you know a thought bubble above it and, I, and it says uh, i am the ant and patience is my weapon that's that's mm. just really what it breaks down to right so um that and i got youtube premium because <laughs> youtube is fantastic mm -hmm. for diy videos you just have to simply be smart with your baloney detector and just you know realize who's sort of feeding you uh, uh who's just parroting something they heard and somebody who generally knows what's going on mm -hmm. now of course like in like my room i didn't like wing it wing it like i did get the soil compaction test i had an engineer sign off on that stuff i'm not going to risk damaging the rest of my house just because i want to save you know a few money at a, cru a few bucks on a crucial step right but if you're ever digging near what's called the footer pour of your foundation, you don't want to mess around. But um, but a lot of that stuff, um, you can just simply, you know, read, read, read some more. The inspectors will, you know, they won't sign off on it if it's bad work, right? It's like, especially like if it's somebody who's licensed, they barely, barely pay attention. But me? No, they're going to put me through the ringer. <laughs> That's what he thinks, at least. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Although Ryan's say, gonna have us all sign waivers in his basement just in case the I thing happens on us. Well, <laughs> I sometimes wonder though. Like, I find lots of stuff when I go through houses that other people, like pros, have built, and I find mistakes all the time. Like, I found mistakes with my gas line here when I was installing mine. Like, oh, this isn't properly grounded. You know, this is like, you know, I think it's called CSST tubing or whatever. If you're going to be using some flex at the tail end of a run or whatever, you need to have a certain gauge ground that it runs for certain reasons. And you need to have some kind of, you know, like it's almost like flashing, like you don't want it coming in contact with certain kinds of surface uh, surface materials along the way, too. And I'm finding all sorts of little mistakes here and there. And it's not that those people don't care. It's just that for them, it's just a Tuesday. And for somebody like me, it's an obsession just for my project. I also, if somebody else paid me to go do their job, I'm not going to, you know, freak out about every little step along the way. So, so that's, I think that's where a lot of that can happen. Um, what's the old t saying? Hard work. Yeah, they are. Absolutely. I mean, good grief. Um, I heard uh, Ferrari spent over 10 million bucks in Vegas because they didn't all their road tests didn't pan out correctly. And they had one little manhole cover like spring up and the concrete or the like the asphalt broke loose and it ruined a 15 million dollar car. It's like, yeah, compaction tests matter. <laughs> yeah. So do you have a picture of your current what it currently looks yes. like? So yeah, let's do that. Let's uh, let's do a little bit of a fast forward, shall we? Um, you can keep I've, going. We just I didn't mean to pause you with that comment. It was just popped up over the top of your screen share. No, so no, that's totally fair. Down. Well, let's uh, let me pop up just another series of photos real fast. Then just well, he's like pulling that up. I also want to say yeah. Ryan's Ryan's being humble here. He he's a do it yourself pro. Like his old theater was amazing, and everybody in Kansas City that went there was really impressed with his work. It looked very very professional. He did it all himself. So it's it's that kind of thing, you know, that that you're going to anticipate. And and for what it's worth, uh, Chirpy is hosting one of the M Wave stops for the ticket holders. So uh, that's that's one of the reasons he's featured here tonight. Is we kind of wanted to show off what he's working on. Chirpy, did you just do that to give you ammunition Motivation. to make sure that you finish the theater? Um, yes. Well, um, <laughs> no, partly. Um, yes. yes no. no maybe. <laughs> so. So um, this will make sense, I think, for some people when I say this. Um, um, I can now use this to bat down all the other honeydews my wife comes up with. Because, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so like, like if anybody who follows my thread, they, they, they're sort of kind of getting a little miffed at me because I'd always come back after a long hiatus and be like, how's it going? I'm like, well, I did this other project instead. And then I did this other project instead. And then I did this other project instead, right? You know, like my wife was like, can you do a deck extension can you build a fence or one of the rental properties is br broken or you know i want to tear out all the wood floors in the master bedroom or carpet in the master bedroom put in wood floors you know that kind of stuff and now now that i have a deadline i can be like 
Sorry, honey, there's nothing I can do. You mean you couldn't just tell her you have the capability of getting YouTube Premium too? You can figure out how to do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, not only that, but I think some of this. Yeah, fair point. <laughs> the other probably the wouldn't other have gone over very well. It's and I think you know some people you know can can you know testify to this. If if I would have like done badly on any one of those tasks, that probably would have been the correct move. Right. But instead it went according to plan. So mm. that only emboldens a person. They're like, oh, well, that one don't just fine. Let's go do another one. Right. Mm. So that's that was her mindset. It's like, oh, we'll just give you this one and then we'll give you this one. And, and it's like just, you know, shoveling coal in the furnace. And you just sort of get used to the habit of just saying now you can do this. Like literally when we moved into our house, she's like, I want to swap out all the switches in the house. It's like literally the day after I swapped out 36 light switches in the house. It's like, it's like, um, it's, 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 it's enabling the junkie on the corner is what it's doing. You got to be careful. I know that feeling. <laughs> Except my wife is the police and she's trying to get me to stop. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I want to see, I want to see, um, are you going to do like any on the side testing with that subwoofer when it shows up? Or are you going to wait till the whole thing's done before you plug in? I'm curious. Sorry, this is a segue to something else. But that oh, you, fifty, you, in, that you're fifty inch, about just turning it on. And yeah, yes, he will. I mean, course. you have to. I don't know. I, where am I going? The problem is, where am I going to put it to do said testing? What I'm going to try? Up before goes anywhere in the kitchen, <laughs> in the bedroom. <laughs> I think what what I'm going to try and do is we're going to. I have to try and like consolidate as much as I can at the freight point because we're going to be bringing stuff in from Germany. So I'm going to try and get it as much of it shipped together instead of doing it onesie twosie. So hopefully when I get everything, the room will be ready for it. It won't yeah. be, there won't really be any waiting. That's, that's the plan at least depending on how quickly we can get the Officina stuff figured out. Um, I mean, we could finish really early. I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to take. We could finish, a few months, several months early. We're we're just gonna find out. I'll I make sure know, not. How are you gonna get that thousand pound subwoofer? Literally a thousand pounds. What you said it was. Mm -hmm. Is that gonna go down your stairs? Piano movers. It'll fit. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean piano is way heavier. Honestly, a piano is yeah, way heavier. I'm taller than it is, and than the sub is, and I can go down the stairs. I mean, I'm not hitting anything, so theoretically, it should go down. <laughs> I think. Put a little. A little I like that he said. I steps. like that he said theoretically, right? Theoretically. That's, that's that's actually just wisdom talking, because if you don't, you know, preface that, then anything that's any bad mishap is happen. then directly your yeah. fault. Right. Yeah. So piano movers, it'll come down. Um, I probably should do some more measurements to make sure it'll make the turn. In but. 2013, we pulled a a uh, horn subwoofer. I'm trying to remember the name of DTS-10 that was around 400 pounds. And there was a group of us trying to get it down the stairs for the subwoofer shootout at uh, mm -hmm. Husker Omaha's place. Mm -hmm. I was on the bottom of that subwoofer, and there was a guys at the top. And I was so glad that somebody was behind me pushing on my back because that weight all comes down to the bottom person. And I think I would have got just smashed over by that thing if someone wasn't right behind me pushing. So I, I'm not coming over when you're doing the thousand pound one. I'm I'm can I'm two out steps hold a thousand pounds? Well, it's not going to be just on two steps. I mean, it'll it'll probably get slid down in some capacity. I mean, that's how we moved a lot of the the um, the captivators. They just got slid down and up, more or less, down and up the stairs. So I don't really anticipate it being a problem. I mean, stairs are a lot stronger than people give them credit for. Um, I mean, it's a lot of right angles and they're a lot stronger than I think people think. The problem that I'm worried about is just getting it around the corner for the landing. That's going to be the problematic part, but I'm sure piano movers can get that figured out. They've moved tougher things. But yeah, in the end, this is what I gained for all that headache in my room where, um, uh, I ended up having to, I had to hire this part out and that was the pumping into the concrete. It's way too much of a big job for one person to try to pull off. If you try to do it in sections, 
you will get something that's uh, called a cold joint where, you know, the concrete mm -hmm. is cured one on top of the other. And it's just, it's just not as good. It probably would have been fine, but I wanted a monolithic pour. I wanted it all in one piece. So, um, and then what this did was it effectively brought 18 inches back to my room. So I wanted my 12 feet back <laughs> and I got 12 feet and 31, 30 second inches. Nice. And that'll, so that allowed me what I was hope, uh, hoping for, uh, to be able to, uh, uh, build out that whole uh, first row. So I'm, I'll share one more picture on this building, then I'll shut up because I feel like I've been talking too much about it. No, no you haven't working. been talking too much. But I want to know, where's your sump system that you put in there? Like, is it underneath oh. that? Where does so, it go? Uh, okay, let me see if I can't find a photo for that then real fast um, to, um, to talk about that. So what happens is my sump system is in the back of the room underneath the back riser. So it's underneath the third row, kind of like how my sump pump in my previous theater was underneath the second row, right? So um, that allowed, uh, it allowed me to get it away from the front room, it allowed me to have like effectively a hatch on it, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so does this one have all that crap in there? There's a lot of photos in there. I so you just I have a, like a, if it's in the back of the room, you just have that pipe system leading to underneath with some sort of drain field effectively, maybe underneath the, the dig out? The, yes. The, so, so yeah, I basically put in an entire French drain around the perimeter of that sunk down system and then trenched it to the back of the room is what I ended up doing. And so um, that allowed me to uh, uh, make sure that I wasn't even seeing any water at the front there while I was working on it, but I just assume it's going to show up later just because of the fact that if you don't prepare something, that just always means something bad is going to happen. I don't know of any other situation where that pans out for you just because like hope doesn't waterproof not to my mm -hmm. knowledge so depends so on here's who a you question are. for you and you may have already addressed this in your build thread but i haven't caught up on that i guess if you did i, well, I used to work basement waterproofing for about a year and a half and we wouldn't install the sump wells and occasionally that we would get a call that somebody didn't basically put the little holes in the in the basin well and the water pressure would literally even if it was concreted down would literally pop that sump well out up so do you Absolutely. have any concern with that, with that little drop down that it could potentially pop that up or did you so, put rebar in there and that kind of stuff to make sure? So, so there, uh, there's, uh, literally the whole perimeter of the sunk down section has, uh, four inches of gravel fill underneath it. Mm -hmm. So what happens is it fills up to the gravel fill and then mm -hmm. that pours into the French drain and okay. that goes to the back of the room. Then if you don't do it correctly, actually with the uh, sump basin in the back of the room, um, it is also possible for that, if you install it incorrectly, to also pop out. Mm. If you So you need to drill holes into the side of it mm -hmm. so water can effectively move in and out of it going up and down. Yep. In addition to that, that particular basin that I bought has a bulge at the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. So so it also locks it into place. Mm -hmm. So. So, um, so, and so what I did was I filled a bunch of rock up around that sump basin and, uh, there's a cloth that I wrapped around the actual basin itself directly. And that allowed me to, uh, make sure that the rock itself, cause it's more like pebble size and the holes are smaller than the pebble, but just in case you don't want any debris falling in. Mm -hmm. So that's why you put a permeable, almost like a, a giant, uh, sock that you wrap it in. And that'll mm -hmm. allow it to uh, have the water fill up on it. So uh, I believe that sump basin that I put in was uh, a little bit bigger than normal, 26 inches, 28 inches in diameter. And it was mm -hmm. about four, four and a half feet deep. But I, I, so yeah. So, and on top of that, uh, I had about six inches underneath the basin that I dug out farther still just to have a gravel fill underneath it. So, and um and so I have two sump pits in my house. I have one in another spot that has a battery backup on it uh, and a, also a backup pump on it. And also one in the theater room is the same way. So technically it's four sump pits or sump pumps in the basement just in case. Right. Are you are you constantly getting water in it? Is it the water table at that level just all the time or so just when it rains or what's your experience there? It can be freezing outside. It will still pump water. It can have not rained for months. Um, so, but it's, but it's kind of funny because the way it works, it's always constant. If it's been raining a lot or if it hasn't been raining at all, 
uh, the one in the theater room will probably turn on two to three times a week, like clockwork, rain or shine, freezing or not. And I have that thing go up and out and discharge out of the house into a spot in the yard. And um, so it's it's constantly. Um, now, I'm sure if we had no rain for years, eventually that would stop happening. But basically what's happening is what you're talking about. It's all collecting and filtering at a very slow rate. So if it rains a ton, it's an exceptionally de delayed reaction, sometimes by as much as a day or two. So mm -hmm. it, it just slowly finds its way there uh, eventually. Because most new, con not most, all new construction, at the very least, they'll dig out a, a little ways away from where the, the concrete walls are poured, and they'll fill up gravel or uh, against the wall. They'll, they'll spray a tar on the concrete as well, but they'll fill up gravel against the wall. And so at the very least, the water will find that gravel and go down. So, uh, and then they usually have some sort of uh, water remediation system um, to, to deal with that runoff. And the builders, they'll all handle that slightly different on, you know, like um, like the grade of your property is, you know, like how, how much things are sloping certain directions, water tables that you, like you talked about flood zones, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure. So Chirpy, your benching and what you did in your basement is actually something that I consider to do in mine. My problem is, is I don't have the width that you have. So I was like, yeah, in order to you're, do that, I'd you're right. in like two feet on each side yep. to support the outside walls. Yep. And I just don't have the width to be able to do that so i'm stuck at a menial like eight and a half feet and then i have to hang all of the officina stuff off of that so i'm going to be at like probably under eight feet in total theater height unfortunately but my room's mm -hmm. going to be vis visibly smaller than yours because a lot of it's going to be eaten up by front and rear baffle wall so I'm but not here's worried. but here's the thing you're doing something that mitigates almost all of that you made a choice up front that that helps that helps a lot in that situation and that's the fact that you're going for one row right yeah. now now it's true that from an audio standpoint higher ceilings helps can help a lot for audio it that's does. one of the reasons why i want it it can help a lot um at least as far as uh, you know for stuff like sight lines and stuff like that though um mm, at least you're it, so it helps in sight lines but it also helps in consistency across the, even a single row because you don't have as much of an SPL fall off because your doubling of distance increases, yeah. right? So instead of a doubling happening at one to two meters, now it may be happening at, I don't know, four to eight meters if your room's really tall. So you have much wider spread over, which gives you a much wider consistency for um, your seat to seat volume levels, which is, I think the CD recommended level four, um, you have to meet all of those specs in order to hit those targets. So yeah. I'm not going to be able to do that because my Atmos and stuff is going to be too close. Um, so I wanted to, but, you know, I guess I spent my money in other other ways. <laughs> but, but also, too, like you made an excellent point. You know, it's like sometimes, you know, what's that cliche? A lot of life is about timing. Like if you try to get, you know, if you try to get into a home loan now, the percentage rates now versus what I'm we sure what you had. It. Yeah. It's it's but it's 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 a definitely well um, we actually had a house a, picked out a like we were going yeah. I was we we're ready to pull the trigger they were we were waiting on them to get back to us with the cost of the build and I was trying to get them to build like uh, at the front after the actual room would have been able to be 14 feet tall right and it was they wanted an astronomical amount of money in order to make that happen just for an unfinished room. I mean, it was over $200,000. I'm like, uh, we're not going to do that. I mean, maybe if we had the 2% interest rates, but mm -hmm. at 8% or whatever the hell you're That's getting now, it, yeah. it's not worth it, especially with the interest rates that we have locked in. The house delivers everything, um, and it the theater will be fine, especially now that I decided to do one row. It allows a lot more... Things that was my pro and con, right? Chirpy's going multiple rows. He's got a bigger space. He's able to accommodate that. And on the other end of the spectrum, I've got a smaller room. And in order to compromise or compensate for that, I just went one row. So yeah, I have a question for you. You said you said the uptick in price was two hundred thousand dollars for that home theater room to be dug that deep, or that was for the basement pour. If you did a room that deep, like what was the actual uptick between 
here's the house that was normal people get. And here's my home theater room. It's 14 foot deep. What's what was the, it would have been an life? increase of $200,000. Holy smokes. That Let me, can I talk about, can I make, can I make a comment about what my hard costs were? I'll just yeah. I'll throw out real ones just to show uh, like, like how good of a spot I think I was in and why I ended up pulling the trigger for that for myself personally. They already partially excavate where the garage goes. They dig it six feet down. They backfill it. They put in pier pours and then they pour something on top of it. So they're going down halfway already. And then it just all gets covered up. Oh, oh, hold on. This was a suspended garage. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, what, so, mine was suspended. Yeah. Just to make sure that that's clear. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I get that. So, 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 but, but for myself, because they do that work already, some of those costs they're already doing regardless. Yeah. So, so, but the part that surprised me for myself was, uh, uh, um, this would have been 20, 20, beginning of 28, no, 2017, this would have been. So this is, this, this is six year old prices, but to show how much prices have gone up for me to the upcharge, to have them dig the rest of the way down and crane in that span creek, I believe the upcharge is around $14,000 for me to get that extra room. Oh, right. That's that's it. 14,000 bucks. Contractor. That, that, so no, 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 That wasn't the problem. So if we would have done it, like just with what Chirpy's talking about, yes, it probably would have cost, and I would have, I would have been fine with this. It probably would have cost 30 to $40,000, which yeah, it increased a lot, but everything's gone up astronomically over that period of time. It just was, it, it didn't make a lot of sense. And yeah, we could have talked to another contractor, but at the end of the day, I think we're going to be a lot, it's a much more financially sound decision to do the pathway that we've chosen now and just renovate the theater instead of buying a new house to have this theater. It just didn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it was, we could have gone down a different pathway and found somebody else, but we just decided we'll just renovate and use what we have. We skipped forward too much. Chirpy, go back, uh, go back a little bit of time. Cause we went yeah. from hole in the ground to studs up. That's is there anything in between? Room, man. Uh, let me go ahead and see if I uh, if I can find something else real fast. Um, let me see. Boop, boop, boop. If you don't have any pictures, that's fine. I just didn't. Oh, know I do. Pictures. I do. I've just got hundreds. Is the problem right? Okay. So, um, so it's like day three and day four here, and day four he put up all the. On the fourth day, <laughs> on the fourth day, no way. On the seventh day, the chirpy rested. I yeah. believe is how it works, right? Uh, actually, I did want to I did want to pull up this photo real fast because it helps show the whole room and what we were talking about. So if you'll see uh, in the at the back of the room there near. Uh, Is that the sump? Yeah. Yeah. You'll see the sump at the very back of the room right there. And and so that's that trench that I basically dug all the way across from there to there and put in the pump, uh, sump right there. And then I went up the wall inside of here. You can't see because the drywall's up. And then I had it go out. Plus, I wanted to point this out over here. You see that right there and that right there. I actually uh, had put it put in when they did the concrete pour. Those are, uh, I had been put in penetrations for, um, I wish I would have done a little bit bigger. I did four inch. I should have done at least five inch. Those are for fresh air used air exchange. With an, uh, with an HRV slash ERV, depending on where you live in the country, one makes more sense than the other. So one's uh, heat and one's energy recovery ventilator. So um, basically what they do, though, is they, they keep the air fresh because it's not enough to have an HVAC system where it's heating and cooling the room. You, you want to introduce fresh air and get rid of the expelled used air in rooms like this, and especially rooms like this. Because they are, you know, if you're building it right, they get sealed so tightly if you're doing it right. And so what ends up happening, especially if you have a room that's going to have 10 people in it and you watch Lord of the Rings, all of a sudden people are yawning and they don't know why. It was like, well, you're literally running out of oxygen. So you want to be able to introduce a certain amount of air exchanges per hour in those types of situations. But wouldn't you get this something similar just by having ret a return vent? So... Um, uh, so a return vent to the rest of the house, sure, but I put in mine's completely closed off. Oh, so you wanted it totally separate. So it's a totally yeah. separate system, okay. and so because of that, uh, I'm actually going for uh, what's called a ducted mini split. So it's not yeah. one of those that hang on the wall. That's a ductless mini split, 
And so what that ends up allowing you to do is uh, they're, they're much quieter. Uh, that's one of the things they do well. They're pretty stinking quiet. They're pretty stinking efficient. And so, but they don't have, you know, they don't introduce, you know, the fresh air used air thing. You need to have something in conjunction with it mm-hmm. in order for it to work, to, to work better. Now, is it possible to put in a mini split in a room and watch a movie if the door closed and be just fine? Sure. Like this is just, you know, this is sort of like a little extra thing that I built in my project uh, as I went along uh, is, is all that happened here. But um, uh, let's see here. Oh, where yeah, do people I in the comments here? saying that you should have oxygen masks drop from the ceiling if it gets to. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Ryan's going to be the one who really needs those, right? <laughs> like I, I only, I say only, where's, where's my only photo? Let me get to a little bit closer to the here and there now. So. Um, I only have um, four 21-inch four Martys. Poor me, right? So, nice. so um, I'll be curious to see. You know, like at first, you know, my wife was like, "This is ridiculous," but she's experienced my old room, mm-hmm. and Jonathan's experienced my old mm-hmm. room. My old room with a 12-inch sub, double was, 12, wasn't it? Was it to be no, fair? That was an SVS V. That was just one PB2? single 12 in that room that shook the whole place. Yeah, that and, was remarkable. And not Something in a was... gimmicky way. Like, you could feel it in you. Like, the, it was tactile. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be lucky to get back to there, plus a little bit more, just because of the amount of volume I have now. My mm-hmm. previous room, I want to say, was just under two, uh, maybe uh, just under 2,000 cubic feet. This one will be about 6,000 cubic feet, right? So it's just so much more volume. And you can't cheat physics. If you want to pressurize air, you have to move air. It yeah. is a giant concrete bunker, though, so you'll have boundary gain. Yes. Out the, out, yeah, I would think. So we'll I, there, will, there will be boundary gain. I'm a little the, bit worried about your decay times. So I, that's very true. So, like, um, m- my room is going to be, the challenge is not going to be trying to get a, you know, flat frequency response across the way. It's when you turn, it. it's when you turn on the waterfall and you look at the decay yeah. that happens after the fact. So that's going to be the part that's going to be a little bit trickier where you make sure everything's taken care of. But, um, so here's most a question of, about the subs up front. And I think sure. Jonathan, you can talk about this because this is how your subs are currently set up. Yeah, he can play with that a little bit. He'll take measurements, he'll move them a little bit, and he can probably make it so that they don't all have the same nulls and modes at the main listening position. And he'll be accounting for three different rows, so he's not going to be able to make it perfect to the MLP without affecting the other ones. But basically just staggering them a little bit, curving them a little bit, just playing with them a little bit, he'll be able to get that frequency response flat. That'll be okay. Yeah. And, and honestly, yeah, Jonathan's right. There's actually a lot of things that you can do. You can even, fut- uh, maybe I didn't catch it in, in that. You can even slightly delay some and not uh, mm-hmm. not others, right? Ever so slight delays on, on, and we're talking like, you know, in the hundreds of milliseconds or whatever. Yeah. And that so, fixes a lot. Yeah. So, and, and that's definitely the realm of at a minimum, like a mini DSP or something like that, where it worked out perfectly for me that I ended up having, you know, four up front. Well, you know, that's, that's four out on a device like that. Right. Yep. So, so you can go ahead and you can get that, you know, hopefully dialed in with a few extra tools, but outside of that, outside of the syncing it down, um, most of my construction is probably a little bit more what people are used to. I did a couple, um, shortcuts here and there, like there are some. Uh, fancier clips, for example, that I just use the basic ones partially because um, I want to pause you for a second. Explain yeah. what, you're, what you're talking about with clips because the audience may not know. Yes. Some audience will, but not all of them. So let's talk let, step yes. two steps back and talk about what this is. You're very good at this. I appreciate that. So, um, yeah, because I'm more like that, you know, that enthusiastic yippee dog that's cute at first, but after a while, I just want to <laughs> kick it. You're doing so. great. You're doing great. <laughs> okay. Fine. <laughs> so i mean i want to kick you but it's, it's okay I'll, yeah I'll, yeah I'll, off the stream if you're smart <laughs> <laughs> so like this clip that we have for example here they sell different kinds but the idea behind it is you will take this clip you will install them at certain intervals and the manufacturer will have recommendations for what types for certain types of stud spacing but if you look here at this photo it might be a little bit difficult to tell maybe i'll zoom in a little bit you'll see them like scattered in different places 
And once you have these installed, you will then also see up here, you see these uh, look like metal bars. This is basically, it has different names. Some people call it hat channel, some people call it furring channel. And what they do is they clip into uh, the, uh, let's see here, into the clips. And then you install the drywall to that. And the idea behind that is um, uh, mechanical isolation is what we're after. So there's two primary different types of, of noise, uh, audio uh, noise that we're trying to look for in the audio world. Um, some people break it down in more categories, but the two specifically, if you want to think about it conceptually for, for this discussion, one is airborne, one is mechanical. Like that can cover most of it right there. So in this particular case, we're dealing with mechanical. If you take a hammer and you hit a cinder block, you're going to feel that energy travel all the way through. Like my wife can wear six inch heels and walk on the, in the garage above the, you know, above the theater room. And you can hear the clacking straight through because that's mechanical transfer goes straight through that solid object like nobody's business. Now take a hammer and then hit sand with it, right? It's, it, it gets dissipated. It, it can't transfer. So um, it's, it's the problem alleviates itself from the get go. It creates a short circuit. And that's sort of what this is doing here. So what you can do is you can take in my particular case for the ceiling. Um, I put up, a, I believe I put up plywood. I wanted OSB because it had, has more mass ever so slightly than, than similarly priced, uh, plywood. If you compare the two, there's different types of grade of plywood where it would have more mass than OSB, but you have to pay a lot for it. But. In this particular case, I put OSB up, or excuse me, plywood up there first. And then I put, uh, let's see here, 5 8 uh, drywall on top of that, creating a sandwich. So what happens is the, let's say a sound wave comes along, it hits that first layer of drywall, and then it has trouble getting past the green glue, which is a viscoelastic dampening compound. It's basically like anybody ever played with Nickelodeon GAC as a kid, or like that burger glue that's in magazine inserts. It's kind of like that kind of, um, viscosity. So it hits, it hits that layer and it can't, it has trouble making the jump, right? So the audio basically it converts to heat and, and it, uh, cuts it down and then it can't get to the layer beyond it. So let's, uh, but it's not perfect. So then it hits the, uh, plywood and then the plywood screwed into, of course, this, this channel, but since the channel is isolated from the structure in this particular case, it has trouble reaching the two by four, which is mechanically, you know, um, literally drilled into the ceiling above, right? So, um, so that's what the, a clip like that allows you to do with a noise can with a noise canceling. So it's 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 not super cheap for a room this big, but compared to some things you do for uh, isolation, it's actually pretty good. Um, let's see here, product, I think. And they sell different versions of it. They use, they also sell versions that have almost like a plastic, pl plastic-ish, almost super heavy rubber puck underneath it, which helps decouple it even more. Since I'm uh, in my room, I already have like eight inches of concrete on all six sides and I'm building a room within a room. Um, that was one place I decided to save on costs. But How did you couple or attach your studs and joists to the concrete? What did you so, do there? I, I did do that. If I zoom in a little bit, uh, let's see here. This is literally concrete anchors that, that are going up here. And, and they're the, they're those blue screws that you see mm -hmm. if you, if you've ever seen them at the hardwood store before. And so they have a, what they have is they have a pullout rating for them and the pullout rating for the anchor is hilarious. Oh yeah. It's uh, stupid. Yeah, it's 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 uh, if it's installed correctly, I can't remember what it is exactly, but it's 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 in the, like the six to eight hundred pound range if you install a couple correctly. So the weak spot is definitely the clip with the hat channel. <laughs> so, yeah. but one of the reasons why, like some people would, could you know might come along and say, well, Ryan, um, why wouldn't you just do the hat channel? Could you just do the hat channel directly to the concrete and skip? that, you know, these were pressure treated two by fours here. Could you skip that layer altogether? And the answer is possibly, depending on your building codes, depending on where you live, um, you would get some extra space back. In my particular case though, when they craned in those giant concrete pores, as they seam up with each other, 
one section came down, I would say three eighths to half of an inch farther than the other. Oh boy. So it's, so I actually stripped these two by fours at different thicknesses. So they all are perfect going across the room. So I probably <laughs> didn't have to do that. You probably never would have noticed, but I'm building a coffered ceiling up there. And so all I could think of were possible gaps that would appear as a result that I did not want to deal with later. Well, and it gives you another contact point for decoupling and transmission. We were talking about mechanical yeah. isolation and having those boards there provides another means to decouple things. I mean, theoretically, yeah. you could have taken a step further and decoupled those from the concrete. Um, but I think in your position, it's kind of how many percentage points are you willing to chase after? Yeah. In all honesty, it's like you can, I mean, you can go beyond, 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 beyond and every single step if you want to. And it will, yes, technically be quote unquote better, but there's trade-offs like literally. And this is, you know, um, the rigidity of the uh, uh, wall is something you want to take into consideration as well. I don't need to tell you two gentlemen this, but if you make the wall super rigid by building up these layers and having like you know stud spacing that's super close together, lots of contact points, um, your resonant frequency and the flex that you have on the wall, uh, it it will go up and down, mm -hmm. right? It's like mm -hmm. a, a more rigid wall doesn't flex as well, and your resonant frequency point you know goes up. So it's, it's, it's just one of those situations where everything has not even, I don't even think of some of these things as compromises. I just think of it as um, those games that you get like X amount of points. Like let's, I never played D and D. I only got to play it a couple of times, but, but you get like X amount of points for a character, right? And it's like, Oh, speed. Uh, you know, like, a good way to like, look at it actually. So, so, so like you literally have to decide because even if it's money, no object, you're still going to have these, you're going to, you know, yeah. rob one for the other. Yeah. So, so that would be a situation where you have to decide those kinds of things. And then of course, yes, money definitely plays its part too. Like for myself personally, this whole project came about, you know, I told my wife, um, all the money spent on it would be done with freelance money. Right. So every single time I wanted to get farther along in the room, I would have to do some freelance projects. It's like you can't, we could, I couldn't steal from the core nest egg. We have to be smart about this, right? But it's just one of those situations where you just sort of have to um, uh, be smart. And one of the advantages of taking your time is you can score deals like nobody's business. Like shout out to Jonathan right there. Like um, I got a great uh, youth man deal on the speakers that I am using in the room. I'm using the same speakers as the ones in Jonathan's room everywhere except for the heights. But uh, those uh, J, uh, JBL 70 J's, I scored mine brand new each for 25, 425 bucks with tax and shipping. Yeah. And if you go try to go buy them right now, I believe it's what, 1250? Yeah, you got, a, you got a once in a lifetime deal on those things, I think. Yeah. Chirpy took advantage of the fire sale. <laughs> it was yeah. literally a failed city project for the city of San Diego, and they were basically giving them away. Mm. As crazy as that sounds, I don't know how he finds this stuff. He just does. <laughs> but but yeah, these kinds of projects, though, even with studying and building and all this kind of stuff, you cannot know everything. You will make mistakes along oh, the way. Oh, yeah. For the life of me, I do not understand why I r ran my wires, most of them, at this step. I should have, have left them alone and just had a two inch conduit come out of the sidewall and just ran them inside of my soffit when I framed it out. Stupid as all get out to have all these wires poking through the drywall. But there's a lot of them too, right? So um, yeah, I ended up going for, um, they don't have like the best reputation on the, the form. These are the, the, they're not a bad reputation. These are Kraken yeah. subwoofer drivers. Uh, there, I believe they're about 95.6, 95.7 uh, dB sensitivity, and they have a 2,000 watt RMS, 4,000 watt peak. Their impedance curve is kind of nasty, so they get a, so they start to break up a little. Except for I don't see any true nastiness in my room until I'm like in the 110s, 120s, and my crossover at that point, even if it was a generous one, will be long gone. 
especially since I built a baffle wall, which helps with my crossover point on my on my front speakers. Um, let's see here. Let's go through some of this stuff. Um, yeah, this right here. One other thing I wish I would have done. I wish this is what I did for the ceiling. I wish every layer in my room, the first layer would have been OSB. And and I know that there's some people who say, oh, you should have different thicknesses or whatever, and that's what will help um, cancel out certain kinds of frequencies. No, mass is mass is mass. If it's, as far as I'm concerned, if it, you're seeing a, um, having different frequency effects that it's canceling out, if anything, it just means they'll be in different ways, but it won't be quieter. It'll, it'll just be in... Um, I think you should always just go for as thick as you can stand it, as much mass as you can stand it. So well, I think the reason for varying absorption or varying thicknesses is because it varies the level of absorption and what frequencies it's absorbing. It's like using carpet in a theater, right? If you put carpet in, it's absorbing all of one frequency, but it's uncontrolled. So if you can control it, then it gives you some level of more light. And I've heard benefit. that wisdom. I can't find a single test on wall assemblies that have been able to prove it. I can't find one. Um, and I would love to, I would love to hear otherwise. I asked about it. I think maybe it was in your thread, even Ryan. I said, no, if, I don't think it was in, well, maybe it was, but I don't remember reading that. I it's actually, it is. Oh, well, <laughs> I didn't read it. <laughs> I was being nice. No, that's fine. I don't read half the stuff I write either. So I did. I probably read it, but I don't remember reading it is what I'll say. No. Well, I mean, good grief. If I had a dollar for every time I started reading through a, 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 for, a post on AVS form, I'm like, hey, this is a great post. I go to like it and I already have. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that before, too. That's when you spend too much time on the forums. Yeah. So this so, question, this question, let's go. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, actually is a great question. I would say here's the thing. If you have a decent amount of a budget to throw at it, I think it's completely worthwhile to to uh, go ahead and do the other soundproofing steps. But it goes Here's, back but, to what but, we talked about earlier with the waterfall, right? It yeah. stops being necessarily about soundproofing and more about getting out of the room and Decay absorbing the sound that's in the room. Right. So this, this, so there's, there's a lot of other things that come into consideration with this, like literally the, 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 the cavity that you leave behind your wall assembly before it hits the concrete, even there's stuff like that. You also have to keep in, uh, keep in mind. So, um, it, the point, long story short, without turning into a super long discussion, um, there's still benefits. It still can have certain kinds of benefits even with concrete on all six sides. That's the super short answer of it. It still, it still can have its benefits. I actually like this picture because it actually shows just how thick the wall is. Because if you look right here, my poor wife, if you look right here, it's like, this is, this is a six inch. This is a, a right here is a, is an air gap. Then the, then the two by four hits in place. And then it's the, the, the clip. And then I had my two layers of drywall. So it can't be understated, though. Um, I lost a foot of width going this approach. Yep. Right. So, and and if I don't knock it out of the park with my door frame right here, with the door I'm building, if I don't knock it out of my park, all that's for not like I, at least from letting sound get into the theater and getting out of the theater, we won't worry about frequency response and stuff like that. But from a soundproofing standpoint, if I don't do a great job in the door, I might as well. Have skipped half those steps and saved myself a butt ton of time and money because the door is an absolute weak spot and then some. So, um, um, so we kind of talked about that on some of the different episodes before, but getting a door that's solid enough that, that has the seals and stuff. How are you approaching that? What are you, what, what are you looking at there? Uh, uh, I am building my own. So here's the sandwich. Let's go through what this is. This right here is a solid core door that I started with. Mm -hmm. This right here is three fourths MDF. This right here is three fourths MDF. This right here is one fourth or oak quarter panel. And then then will be a one fourth cork uh, oak quarter panel over here as well. Um, the thickness matters. But it also matters that I have uh, I put green glue in between that you have to have uh, breaks in the layers. Like an actual good soundproof door is exceptionally heavy, exceptionally expensive. 
um, because they'll need the, the good ones will have these interruptions in the layers. A lot of them will use stuff like uh, lead sheets, for example, and, and then something that will break contact between those layers. Because if you just took two solid core doors and you just screwed them together, you'd have a super thick door that would be just okay-ish at stopping <laughs> sound, right? So having those different layers and having those breaks in the layer are every bit as important. In addition to that, this right here, I routed this out at the bottom right here. This is what's called an automatic door bottom. So if you see this little screw right here, what will happen is when the door swings shut, it'll hit, it'll hit the jam of the doorway and it'll press against it. And then this rubber bottom that we got down here will drop down and seal itself against the floor. Um, there's fancier stuff than this where you can also route out the floor itself and have it uh, drop into a sl uh, basically a, uh, a slot in the floor as well. Uh, in addition to that, that stops some of the sound. I haven't gotten to the next step, but you need to have what are basically uh, line gaskets all around the frame of the door on one side as well. So, uh, so it's kind of like it's kind of like a more expensive, fancy version of what you'll see with like weather stripping on an exterior door, which is actually what I use for the lobby entrance to the theater room. I haven't finished some stuff down here yet on the base of the door. But the lobby area, I put in a, uh, an exterior door, and then I built a seal for the bottom of that. And I'm almost depressed, to tell you the truth, how decent the sound is keeping out. And I haven't put the other door up yet. I'll be honest. I've built this door so heavy now, I, don't, I can't lift it <laughs> by myself. It's around 260, 270 pounds. Ooh. So, so if, it was, if it was just, you know, like weights, I could lift it and move it right i'm not a big guy but i'm flexible i guess we'll say <laughs> but <laughs> so but since it's a door I, i'll probably end up having you get you know those uh moving straps and i'll probably also do something that'll really add to the comp to this is not how i recommend building a normal door but i'm probably going to install it and then uh, build the, the strike plate side. I'll probably build that in after I install the hinge side, just so I know it is exactly correct because, um, I want it to be on the money and it's, and I don't want to lift it and put it in place more than once, one time only. So, but that's, that's something that you have to be really careful with when you spend all these times trying to soundproof these rooms and then you trip on the finish line. And this right here, is an area very much where you can exit. You want to make sure that you get something like this done correctly, right? So this is the section that I've spent, uh, been spending an inordinate amount of time trying to finish out correctly. So um, it's tricky. It's time consuming because I don't know what I'm doing. What do you have wires coming in there to the left of your door frame there? What okay, the so, so this right, so this is, yeah, so this is a, this is a, um, electrical but what this will need to be is uh it's partially it's hard to tell from here it starts it needs to be wrapped in it is wrapped into conduit until the term until that part right there but i'm going to probably terminate it with a with like a metal box right there and have it go down but that's for stuff like um uh one of those is for like a smoke detector kind of thing because it's you need that in a room uh, um for, in this type of situation because it is cut off from the rest of the house and so it's wired to all the other smoke detectors. If the one goes off in this room, then all the other ones go off in the house or vice versa. The house could be burning down and you're just watching a movie and you don't know you're in your tomb already. <laughs> so that's also a just problem. Jump in your sump pit. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> or actually that fresh air exchange. Hopefully it's basically a fireproof chamber that's going to get a little bit warm and then I'll just walk out of, you know, the embers all around me. Who knows? But, um, but you also noticed uh, too, like this whole area right here, I'm currently um, like running PVC pipe for some stuff. Uh, this one right here uh, in particular is uh, going to be running uh, all the way this way to the back of the room over to where the projector is going to be just to, uh, it's it's a long enough room that, I, that I, I'm not going to do, you know, just the, the orange um, flex conduit. I'm going to be using just PVC, but oversize it instead. So about two inches what I'm using. And it's all it's only two what they call long 90 angles. 
It, they, they, they sell a standard 90 angle, but it's too short. So they sell a longer one that's more, you know, uh, they gradual. doom it out a little bit more. It's longer, so it makes it a more gradual curve, right? So it would be the same as if you bought like 245s and put a little bit of space in it almost. So you would want to no more than two or three max bends on something like that if you can help it. So I'll use that. Um, it'll actually stop right here and interrupt. And I'm going to have a hatch on a column I'm going to build right here. So this is going to sort of be an access point for me to get to stuff if I need to. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to send one conduit pipe going this way towards the front of the room and then this way towards the back of the room because you don't know what the future is going to hold, right? Mm -hmm. So so um, you just try to keep all that kind of stuff in mind as you go through these kinds of things. And that's why, you know, I'm one of those guys who unfortunately stares at his room and not work on anything for like five or six minutes a lot just because I'm like, what have I forgotten? What have I forgotten? What have I forgotten? But getting a little bit closer to where I am right now, before you do, there's oh, two sorry. questions on the door. Sorry, sorry. Where, Go ahead. Where do you purchase your door hinges at? And how many do you have to use for that heavy a door is one question. All right. And what does your door handle look like? Mm. Oh, I'm so glad somebody asked that question because I'm going unorthodox with that too. So first off, uh, door hinges... I I done I didn't go anywhere special. I went to Amazon and I bought off the rated poundage for the manufacturer and then overkilled it a little bit. So I bought uh, four uh, I want to say four and a half inch uh, hinges. Um, three of them are rated for 200, uh, 50, 300 pounds, 300 pounds I think. Uh, three of them are rated for three hundred pounds. I'm using four. Uh, and they've got, uh, you want to be looking for some, uh, a certain type of, you want the one the hinges that have like ball bearings and stuff like that in them. You want ones that are, um, actually like tested, tested rated. I checked, I can't find the ones that I bought anymore. Um, because it'd been a little while since I sourced them, but they're literally like five pound hinges. They're like five pounds each. Right. So it's like you lay them next to what a normal hinge looks like and it's almost comical. So so basically you just have to you want to find a reputable manufacturer and you want it to be something that um, is smooth when it opens and shuts, because some a door like this, um, it's 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 going to grind it down pretty quickly. The mm -hmm. other thing, too, that I didn't talk about is the the door itself. I've re you want to reinforce when I built this door right here. Um, on one side, I used hardwoods. If you'll notice, this part right here is MDF starting here. It's hardwood starting here on this side. Why is that? You want hardwoods on the hinge side for a door this heavy. MDF is not going to be strong enough. I'm going to be routing out this side for the hinge over here. And you want it to be routed out like that because of the fact that you need you need it to uh it's going to be getting a lot of its strength from the rigidity of the you know the structure that it slides into that hinge and mdf is soft right so you want something that's that's uh, you want tight wood cell structure so this is uh, i believe it's it's oak that i use for this one right here and and that's one other advantage those hinges have not only some people think it's the length it's not just the length of the hinge you want the thickness of the hinge too that routes a little bit deeper inside there that it that sits inside there. And then you get some, you have to get those really long screws as well. I'm not using the screws that my hinges came with. I went to the hardware store and found matching uh, screws that were about an inch long, inch and a half longer than the ones that it came with. <laughs> Plus it's hardwood on the, um, on the door jam side itself where those hinges are going. Plus the fact that I, I, um, I have no airspace. Um, let's see here. I don't think I have a picture of it. Let me see if I can at least speak to the section like this spot right here. This is the two, this is a pressure treated two by six that is anchored into the concrete. And then I am adding hardwood on top of that. Right. So it's not like there, there is no like airspace in between on the hinge side. It's, it's gotta be solid, solid. You want at least a couple, you know, at the very least, like two two by sixes put together if it's not going to be anchored to something heavy, if not something even more substantial than that. Um, you want it to feel feel like concrete, even if it isn't uh, anchored to it when it deals with the hinge side on something like this. Sure. Because, 
Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why a proper soundproof door costs so much. Like a really good one, you're looking at least in the five to seven grand range for a really good soundproof door. And now a lot of that has to do with, you know, the frame that it comes in as well, along with all those other things we talked about. A soundproof door you buy that's a good one will be kind of like mine uh, in that it'll have all those sandwich layers, but it will not be as thick, but it will be just as heavy. Right. So that's something else that you you get from them. One other thing that I might mention on the door as well. You see that slight angle that I have on this. It's very slight. I, I cut a slight angle on this for the uh, on the strike plate side. So when it closes, um, it makes up for the fact that the door is so thick. You want it a little bit. Uh, you wanted it to taper a little as it hits towards the seal. So you need that, keep that in consideration as well when you have a super thick door. So there's lots of little details in building a soundproof door like that. In regards to the handle, sorry it took so long to get to that part of the question, but there's, there's a lot to get through. In regards to the handle, I'm actually not drilling all the way through the door. I'm just using a push plate on one side and I'm going to use a pull handle on the other. And then I'm just going to, I'm going to attempt magnet catches at the top of the door. I'm guessing that I'll probably have to do that in addition to a commercial strength closing arm at the top. But between those two, the advantage that that gets me is I don't have to cut a big hole in the middle of my soundproof door, which tends to also be a really big weak spot as well. So what you would do is um, um, on the door, if it was the top of the door, like in this section right here, you'd route out a section and you would drop in the magnet on the door there and then on the door frame itself you'd route out a section and you put the you know the other magnet up there and so as it closes they stick to each other and they sell they can sell some heavy duty magnets too and it's the kind where you have to be careful that if you're playing with them that you don't accidentally mm -hmm. like pinch your skin and when i say pinch your skin i mean like it hurts because they slam into each other in fact if they're if you do it just right, they can slam into each other so hard they'll accidentally shatter themselves. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's a fun toy to play with, though. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. So I actually uh, the whole uh, um, theater room as it gets built out, I'm hoping to put some Art Deco uh, type touches in there. That's uh, sort of you know where we started with the door here. Why we picked that particular style. We want to uh, have it be, um, you know, I feel like that's one of those styles that has aged pretty decently over the years um, where it hasn't gone completely out of style, but I'm probably not going to go like too garish with any colors. Plus, I'll probably keep the front of a room basically black and then transition to detail colors a little bit as you get to the middle of the room and then to the back. So I'm sort of ripping off the famous Rob Hahn theater from that standpoint. But I feel like that's a good compromise because I'm one of those people who um, I, it's fun to look at the speaker drivers. But when I walk, watch a movie, I don't like getting distracted. I'm one of those guys. I, and everybody's different. Everybody has different mm -hmm. priorities. Some people like to see those woofers moving at the same time as the, you know, the on screen action. And and that's eh, that's not me. And that's fine. But um, I'm pretty close uh, to the process now where, oh, um, excuse me. Um, so I went through different layers here on the front, building out the baffle wall here. I put in some just in case wiring here that I don't know that I, I don't think I'm ever going to use, but they're there just in case I've hidden them. And um, I put in three layers on the front of the wall where most baffle walls, they'll tell you, you know, three layers is a, is a pretty good um, um, wall assembly. And in this particular case, it needed it needs to be because the subwoofers are directly underneath. And I and one of the advantages of having the subwoofers in there now, they get in the way a lot. Don't get me wrong; it's a pain in the butt. And you got to be careful; you don't want to damage them. But like every week or two, I run a rattle test, and I fix it, and then I keep on building stuff. And then another week or two later, I run a rattle test. And then I fix it. So that's been actually pretty great for hunting that kind of stuff down as I go. Um, of course, the disadvantage is one day I'm going to, you know, knock a ladder over and it's going to go through a driver. And then I'm going to be like, because those, those stupid drivers are 100 pounds each. It's stupid. 
Are um, your stubs underneath the speakers or are they recessed into the wall? They are recessed into the wall. So that wall is, I believe, I want to say, like literally it's three layers there, but I put insulation. This, um, this step right here, it's R38 insulation. We're talking 14, 16 inches, and it's still not quite touching the wall behind it. So I want to say it's probably 18 inches recessed plus sticks out. So that's how far out the subwoofer is because it's not just the depth of the subwoofer. It's an additional three inches. I, you know, I might, I probably could have shaved some, some depth off of it, but I didn't. I just, I just went with the default sub design where the, the, um, speak on connector on the back goes straight out of the back of the sub. So you at least need to also need the depth for the connector itself as well. So you're looking at another three inches there. Um, so, so it's probably around whatever the, the depth of a full Marty is plus another three or four inches. So you're probably, I can't remember the exact measurements. You're probably looking at 27, 28 inches, right? And then if you put two by fours in front of that and build out the screen wall in front of that, you're looking at almost three, you know, you're looking at around two and a half, three feet off the wall for your screen wall at that point, which is why, um, uh, I'll finish the tour with the most recent photo in a second. I'll have to reshare my screen for that one, but. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I added to this part that you see down here to build it out just a little bit more. But then uh, I did this. I did the same thing everybody does, where uh, I I put up you know some panels up front, and it, I bought these so long ago. I don't remember the exact amount. Usually the absorption coefficient for this kind of product isn't quite as high as the what's the Mainsfield John Mainsfield product? I always forget Lin Acoustic. Um, anyway, I think it's usually around a 0.8. These usually run in the 0.65 to 0.7 What range. thickness is that? Are those two, two, two inches, I believe. Okay. So, so that that's just to you know uh, just cut it down a little bit. Honestly, the R38 insulation is probably doing a lot more good for the room oh, sure. than these are. <laughs> so, so you had you said you had three layers. Is there drywall? Are you talking three layers of drywall that are? Oh. Or is that OC seven hundred three, or what is the what is the three layers you were talking about here? So, so in this particular case, I apologize. Um, I might not. So here's the first layer. I'm sorry. There's your okay. first layer. So in that particular case, look at that. Look at that sin right there. I'm just using OSB and and plywood next to each other instead of the same material all the way across. Why'd you do that, Ryan? It's what I had lying around. Sure. So shame on you, right? But in this particular case. Um, you don't have to worry about the seams because I didn't lay them directly on top of each other. I stag, I built one left to right, the other one right to left. So they, you know, and it's green glue in between each layer. So the seam takes care of itself. In this particular case, the mass is incredibly similar. Um, so yeah, it's true. Um, if you wanted it perfect, perfect. If you wanted to be, or even for me, just looking at the photo, it triggers my OCD and it makes me unhappy. Um, but in this particular case, I made a compromise. But then the next layer uh, was uh, the drywall, um, and so that went up on top. And, and if you if you look at the two, it's like what I was talking about. If you look right here, the thin side is here. If you look over here, the thin side was over here. So they they overlap the 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 seams aren't directly on top of each other. So they they cross over, and and so it crosses over here. You can see right there. And then when I came back over here, I crossed over back the other direction again. So they 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 basically fill in the gaps as you go. So, so doesn't, it, this is probably uh, the acoustic part of this is not something I'm as strong in, but doesn't that 14 to 16 inch of uh, dampening material you put behind there of insulation, does that kind of get lost with the three layers of boards in front of it to where it doesn't do a whole lot besides the back of the reflecting of the speaker or the subs itself? So so it it you're correct that it, it basically mitigates a lot of that. But the reason why I have it back there is to fill the air cavity. And that's mm -hmm. a resonance issue as much as anything. Okay. And and it also, um, I didn't, uh, so it's open underneath the subs, right? Into the back as well. So, okay. so there's that as well. So the fact, in a perfect world scenario, if you want to change the frequency response of your room mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for the rest of the room for measurements. Like, let's say you're trying to change, you know, uh, room modes, that kind of thing. 
you don't want it to be open on the bottom here. It throws almost all of that, eff not almost all of it, but it disrupts a lot of that effort, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that I have my subs up there and they're so deep and I have to make that compromise, um, the, it changed it. Um, I don't get that quote unquote benefit, but in my particular case, I wanted how it behaved with the larger size room depth, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. So mm -hmm. based off where my second row is, my second row is my selfish individual section. I'm trying to build the room sort of, you know, to make everybody happy, but I'm also trying to make the room be, you know, uh, fun for everybody else as well. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but, uh, but it's, you know, at the end of the day, I'm the one who's down to the most. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those kinds of things. Um, but you're right, uh, where you would have to, you make these kinds of uh, trade offs. In my particular case, uh, I measured it. I don't have the graph with me. It's on another computer. I was curious to see um, the 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 how much it would change the the um, speaker right here that JBL seventy J. Correct me if I'm wrong. Technically, they're sort of they sort of give up the ghost in the '60s ish, if they're I recall. Fortune to '65. That's correct. Yeah, and and so um, what happens with uh, even in this particular kind of wall, it uh, it gains more efficiency, right? You know, mm -hmm. in that lower mid range there, right there. So um, you want to do you get an advantage out of that? You just have to know that you did get that advantage. Otherwise, you have an unintended spike that you you know you need to EQ out, right? Mm -hmm. In this particular case, it's actually making their job easier as they get closer to that crossover point down mm -hmm. there, and it gives me more leeway um, um, with the SBL uh, and the handoff to the subwoofers. So that's a couple of things that I got out of that with the wall. Biggest disadvantage by far, though, is what if I want to swap this speaker out? Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is going to be awful. Those th that sandwich, it's thick. It's like almost. It's basically like two inches almost, yeah. right? It's it is a thick sandwich, which is you know sort of you know you want that because the subs are right there and you want the dumb thing vibrating. But at the same time, if you want to oversize it, it's going to be a bit tricky. I did do a little bit, and it's kind of hard to see here. Uh, actually, no, it's not that hard to see. If you'll notice right here. I framed out the actual two by four section to the size of the 70 J's bigger brother, the, the bigger CBT brother. 1000. CBT I was going to say something. Yeah. Yep. The CBT 1000 can fit in that section. So if I wanted to, I could probably take a sawzall to that thing <laughs> and, and cut it out. And then, and you know, I'd probably have to redo some of my foam wedges, but so what? Um, I mean, so I think it, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that bad. <clears throat> no, sawzalls can <laughs> make quick work of that. It would, yeah. the bigger problem would be if you wanted to make it smaller. Yeah. So what you would end up having to do in that situation is you just have to like literally t tear out the speaker that's there right now. And you'd just like start packing in two by fours on the side and you have to use like 45 angle drills and stuff like that. Cause you're running it, which I actually had to do in some spots because you don't have the depth of a normal drill and you're trying to go in from the side with long screws and it's a pain in the butt. So. But yeah. Ryan, since you have the same speakers as I do, Chirpy, I should call you so we don't get confused here. I yeah. recently found out I had uh, and I was talking to Sheldon about this here in the last week or so. I I've had those speakers now for five years and I love them like full stop. I have about a half dozen songs that I've found that reliably create resonance with them. Like there's kind of like a plastic oh. chassis sound and I can I can give you that playlist in the meantime. I've never really bothered with it because it's like so few. Like I, I, I've put them in a playlist so that I know they're there and I could go and recreate it any time. I was playing with that this last week and I found out that if I went and held like, because it's plastic cabinet, right? So it's just what it is. If you, if you like pinch the speaker, if I smash the speaker, it stops doing the resonance. So I started like trying to hold different areas to try to figure out where that resonance was coming from. Long story short, um, I found some little nitrile washers you know how the tweeter way comes completely off? That's how I put the RGB lights behind it. Right. If you take the tweeter array, the tweeter array totally off, there's 10 screws. You put those little nitrile washers in there, the resonance is completely gone on all those songs. So I'm going to do that with all the speakers uh, in my room, and Sheldon's already started doing it on his. Um, so just something to keep in mind before you... I'd be interested you everything to know up. if you did a compression test on them, and then before and after. I don't think it'll change that at all. So So... When I sent these to ASR to do the measurements, he noted that there was a resonance at like what what do you remember what it was? It was like eight hundred hertz or something. It's just something in the way the cabinet's built. 
so it's not it does the frequency response is still like what it is it's fine it's just mm. that the, the cabinet makes a vibration sound at a certain like poor a certain tune a certain frequency yeah the the, the drivers and the speakers are up to the challenge of the spl it's just the 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 uh the actual structure of the cabinet itself is letting it down so yes like so for instance that's one of the things when my arendelle review those things are like so thick they're inert cabinets right well, these little JBL, the Pro Audio, are meant to be light. The cabinet's pretty thin, and it's plastic. Mm. So, so the solution to that, and I can give you a number. It was a P6 washer for what it's worth. Damn, but these God. little <laughs> tiny nitro washers, re putting those between the tweeter array and the cabinet itself, totally got rid of that resonance on all those tracks. So, definitely worth doing since you have those speakers. Mm. I'll put a note on that in the in the thread on it because it's it's something that was always kind of like annoyed me in the back of my mind, but not enough to like really pursue it because it's so rare to run into it mm. all right go yeah. ahead no you've got so much uh, this is the part that you know i actually you know i've been on the building side of it for so long i can't wait to get to the tweaking side of it because right right mm. now i'm like i want oh i want light you know you're over here like i'm dialing in this this little tiny resonance over here it's like so <laughs> I, get I, I i'll get there yeah happen, and right so and hopefully find some things along the way. I do have a uh, one more photo to show, and this is sort of where I'm at right now. If you want to pop that one up. Oh, add to stage. Here it is. So this is where I'm at right now. So you can see where I. I one of the things I'll say that sort of slowed me down is uh, I have curves in lots of places. Like my, and I will admit I shot myself in the foot in that one, especially when it comes to seating options. So we'll see what I end up picking, but it it's it probably chopped out 90% of the options available to me. So I was liking, for example, um, oh shoot, what was the one at M Wave where they're talking about how they were even gonna have like the beer cooler arm? And it's it was the ones where um um they're a little bit more boxy and they they had the the headrest that comes up. Is it the Calvary? From? No row one or row yeah. one, row, row one, one, that's what it yeah, was. Yeah, his Calvary. Oh, okay. Right. Sorry. Thank you. That was you. the name in the chair. You're right. Okay. There you go. You one up to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, this was one of those things where a lot of those don't, I believe none of them have the angled arm that I know of. And I just, maybe I just need to ask. So it's like one more SKU number in their inventory. I'm sure they'd be thrilled to have, but in this particular case, uh, like the front stage has a curve. All of my stages, uh, a rose behind it all have, um, uh, curves as well and so that just adds like a a, a frustrating um, detail to the room that slows you down a little bit and everything that you do you have to be careful about honestly so um but i was able to get some um height back in front of the subwoofers by building off of the concrete there like literally i have like half inch uh, pressure treated um, wood that I anchored into the little sunk down concrete area. And then I attached my, my, uh, let's see your plywood to the sides of that and then just build it out from there. So, um, next stop for me that I'm working on right now is I'm continuing to work on the HVAC system. So I'm going to be using a combination of things to pull it off. One of the advantages of the coffered ceiling is I will be running some of the HVAC through it. I probably will not be using uh, I'm, I've, I've checked, uh, my, um, um, CFM uh, for airflow measurements. I think if I use flex, uh, duck, uh, flexible duck, it's going to introduce too much, what's called static pressure for how long the run is. And I, and I will, um, not get the airflow I need. So what you have to do in that situation is you have to come up with something that's rigid, but you want something that's rigid that won't rattle. So what that usually means is you have to construct all of your uh, HVAC run with uh, usually like a combination of things, but primarily a lot of, uh, uh, um, oh shoot, what's it called? Um, you build what's called plenums out of it off of your, uh, um, my case, mini split. And so it's basically ductboard, I think is what it's sometimes called. So it's basically just cutting sheets of what is almost like rigid foam, not quite, it's a little bit different. And it's usually got foil on it. 
and you use something like foil tape to um, put it all together to create, you know, basically like rectangular registers running through different cavities and stuff like that. So that will get you uh, less drop in your airflow and it'll allow, uh, also it won't like rattle like crazy, like it would if you were going to be using like rigid metal, which has like the best airflow as far as like, like not slowing the air down with the static pressure. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are my main challenges that are in front of me right now. Looking forward to it. At least you're getting to those challenges. My room is at a standstill right now. Yeah. But you're going to leapfrog me fast, man. Mm, we'll see. It yeah. could be a complete and utter disaster. We're going to find out as things start coming off. Yeah. So you you mentioned a little bit earlier cosmetics that you were kind of going for um, with the door and that kind of style. Do you have color schemes picked out and so forth in here? Is it going to be black or what's your end goal there? So in this particular case, the front area is going to be primarily that. Um, it's I'm going to be going for like almost like a like a aged copper, slightly gold tint. Like Art Deco tends to have like some like gold lines in it. So that's going to be my accent color. I don't like like the full on bright gold look, though. I think it's a little bit gaudy. I want that more of like rustic, almost bronze kind of gold look. So that'll be what I use to like accent some line work here and there in the room. Probably not in the front stage itself directly. That'll be more like a column sidewall kind of thing. In addition to that, it I'm going to go for like a fairly deep blue greenish look uh, for the other color that will be the contrast color for those uh, like gold stripes kind of thing. So um, what will probably happen is I have it in my design for stage one, stage two stuff. Like I want to do like almost like you would call them like art deco, like LED sculpture type stuff on the walls kind of thing. But that's probably going to be an after I finish the room augment it kind of thing. So I'm, I'm, I've got this design figured out to get it like 95% functional and not just functional, but 95% look perfectly good and look perfectly finished. But, you know, then there'll be those hidden wires here and there that I can then go back and uh, start adding some of these other fun flourishes. Because here's the thing that I haven't talked about yet. Um, if you're doing a project like this just to save money, you're going to be absolutely sick of it and give it give up pretty quickly, no matter how much money it's going to save you. You have to actually like what you're doing. Um, that helps a lot to actually spend the time that is needed. And I use this whole project as just sort of my um, escape from everything else kind of project. Like most of the time I spend like my work, I spend all day staring at a computer. So when I get off work, I get to do something with my hands. Right. So, and this scratches that itch for me really well. And, and so it, it brings a, one of the nice things about this hobby is you can sort you can bring so many different fields into it and you can decide which part of the hobby it is that you want to obsess over. So it gives you a lot of leeway on the kind of things that you can really get stuck in, <laughs> if that makes sense. Which part of the part? You, which part of the hobby you want to assess over? That's that's the whole enchilada, I think, at this point. Look at the way this room's coming together. It'll be really nice, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, and and not for nothing, it's not like I'm the smartest guy in the room or anything like that. Um, it's it's. Uh, there's a lot of people who've helped out uh, Big Mouth uh, DC or whatever his name is on AVS Forum. He's amazing. He's in those um, design construction threads. He's like uh, retired now. But he's always hopping in with a great idea or two. Like literally my screen wall, I framed it out based off his uh, minimalist uh, screen framing, right? So like my front wall is just going to be magnetic fabric panels that get laid in after I build out the screen and the screen right now, I'm going to be doing DIY. Uh, I'm going for the, um, I'm going to be using the Severton. Am I butchering their name? I don't even know Severton. that brand. Severton. Severton. Uh, they're, uh, they're, I believe it's their cinema, uh, bright, which is they it's rated for a 1.3. It tests at a 1.1 to a 1.15 gain. Um, I think a pixel pusher actually rated it as having less acoustic detriment than Stewart's, but that I'm not, you know, entirely, I would like to see more than one test on that. Uh, I know, for example, when I, uh, talked about cone filtering tests 
and uh, how close you could put speakers to the screen on my build thread. Um, Chris Seymour hopped in and, and mentioned that perhaps some of uh, Pixel Pusher's tests um, weren't, weren't completely accurate because they require the screen material to be stretched. And so there are some things about it that aren't completely accurate in some of the testing. So I take some of that stuff with a grain of salt, right? So you just have to be aware of those little uh, pop uh, potholes here and there mm -hmm. as you run across this stuff. But I've, I've, I've found enough people on the threads who've tried this material who also tried, I believe it's, um, it's the Studio Tech 130, which is what it gets compared to the most. And they're pretty close. And with Stuart, they, and I don't blame them. It's one way to run your business. But I checked, and the last I checked, they, they don't sell screen material only. And there are some things I want to do with my screen um, that I want to do with that 80. It's in the channel that I'm using is an extruded aluminum channel that's called 8020. That yep. there's all sorts of different bracket stuff that you can do with. And there's some ideas I have in the future on how I want to have this screen flip up that I wouldn't necessarily want to do with a purchased frame, if that makes sense. So, so that's where I'm going with that. Are you doing? Is it micro perf? Yes, it is a micro perf. So I realize, uh, um, so the distance, um, so some people, it depends on how far away you are on a micro perf. There's, there's a perf screen, there's a micro perf screen, and there's weave screens. That makes up the majority of the acoustic Stuart material. Stuart now has an ultra perf. Yeah. So, um, but um, long story short, um, I personally cannot see it or have a very, very difficult time seeing it from the distance of my first row. My first row feels so close to that screen because my screen is going to be roughly two. It's a 2.1 aspect ratio screen that I'm going to use. And it's going to be out. It's a 200 inch screen diagonal, 2.2 uh, two to one. I didn't, I shouldn't say 2.1, 221 is more mm -hmm. accurate. My man. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so, and, and uh, this is, um, I think I posted a video actually of an entire video essay about how a lot of screens, People are using that as a compromise aspect ratio these days. I've, um, I've been reading, uh, seeing it get more popular over the few years. And so I decided to go, I, that's where I wanted to go for him. Mean, I think I made the decision like, gosh, I think it's been a couple of years already, but it's been cool to see it get used more and more. Have you thought about going, Nick actually brought this up, Sir Master to me. Have you thought about doing um, 1.9 to 1? So I know why you're asking, and that's the native resolution, I believe, of the JVCs, for example. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's a possibility. Um, the biggest, the trickiest part of that is even at, uh, let's see here, uh, the, I don't have height limitations on my screen. I could make it mm -hmm. taller if I wanted to, and I didn't because I've sat in the front row, and it's already this. Um and so um, I don't think uh, I want it any taller than it is already. Like I've tested the size with a El Cheapo projector and I've sat in the chair at the three different spots and I've ran the material through on different sizes or whatever. And I don't see myself wanting it that much taller than it is already. If I went, if I went that size, it would have to shrink it from the edges. Oh. And I don't, and I don't think I want to do that. It's, it's, I'm fortunate. Usually in a basement, it's not the height. It's, it is the height you have to worry about. Right. And in my particular case, I went high enough with the height and I was like, yeah, I don't want to go any higher than that. Mm -hmm. So, so I had that. JVC probably won't hold on to that. You think they will, Ryan? I, I got to think that that's going to go away at some point. Cause there's only a game in town that does that. I don't sort think like they're going to get rid of that. A legacy thing, isn't it? I don't think it's rooted in residential projection i think it's rooted in their commercial aspects with their flight sending stuff would be my guess um plus with how much stuff is going to 235 i mean it just benefits 235 you're just getting more light so mm -hmm. yeah. i don't really i don't see it going away i don't know that's why sony got rid of it maybe it was an expense thing i mean the gtz 380 is still that way yeah All of the really expensive Although how old it's crazy to think that projector is already what three three and a half years yeah. old already it's crazy yeah. it feels like it just came out yeah <laughs> way back in the day let me tell you what <laughs> so have you made anything have you done anything that you wish you would have done differently 
Oh my word. So I thought about this, this question, I think about it often and, and I bring it back up in my brain again. And the answer is not really. However, I will say this. Um, if I had to do it again, right? Like, let's say I had to go build this thing again a couple of years. There's definitely some things I would do differently, but just from the payoff standpoint for how much effort it took, mm -hmm. like I, what I would do is I would try to find a room where I would actually rotate the whole thing where I sit and just have two rows, five wide. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden it makes everything way less effort. You don't need to worry about your ceiling height as much. Like um, you don't, uh, let's see here, you don't, uh, you can get away with a slightly, a lot smaller screen if you want to. Um, uh, it's like, you're not um, having to worry about um, just literally like trying to find a, a lumen cannon just to fill the entire space to make three rows happy. Like you're sitting 26 feet back to, or 25 feet back or whatever in my room from 200 inch screen doesn't seem that big. Right now, now you look at it from the second row, it seems plenty huge, right? You're going 200 inches. Yeah. 200, 200 inches to one. That's why I want, that's why I want to gain screen as much as possible. Right. And that's also why, and this is, I'm going to really make you groan with this one, Ryan, wait for it. <laughs> one of the ideas I've been tossing around is a stack. Oh yeah. Yeah. What would you because, do? Stack so, though doesn't matter. Um, well, I should say it matters. Here's the thing. It would be, it would matter more with how the, the units, um, 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 uh, unit variation on, mm -hmm. you know, convergence and quality of lens and stuff like that. Cause like an El Cheapo where you're really lucky to get one that looks good. And then I'm like, Oh, I finally got a good one now. Good luck finding another one. that will look just as good overlaying with it. Right. That tends to be one of the things you get with a higher quality projector or with something like, you know, Christie's projectors, or even actually some of Epson's, I wish they would carry it over to the consumer side. They have like, uh, they have like stacking mapping software built into those things. Now, granted, they might bring some artifacts to it because of how they're, they're probably distorting some geometry a little bit, I'm sure. But um, I'm one of those people that think resolution is like fourth or fifth on the list of things that matter in, in a room's presentation. You know, I'm, I'm sitting, even if it's 200 inches and I'm seven, if I'm sitting 16 and a half feet, 17 fat feet back from that, I'm probably looking around the two and a half K range, probably maybe, maybe three ish. Definitely won't be able to see like perfectly. Like if I was pixel peeping or if I was watching a 42 inch TV from two feet away, but, mm. but, but definitely, um, any model that, you know, sort of falls in that wheelhouse, like just for spits and giggles, I told Jonathan, it'd be fun just to, you know, du du double stack, uh, you know, some a couple MZs or even the Epson just to see how badly they line up with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, now I know Nick would throw a bloody fit because I, mm -hmm. and I know that because I've suggested on the discord channel for M wave and he's like, this and this and this, I'm like, I know, I know all the crap that you have to deal with that. There are some things like, for example, you're never going to be doing any memory, uh, lens memory stuff, or, or, or at least I don't see it working very well, right? Like you set it for one ratio and you dial it in perfectly. If you try to like, oh, I'm going to now switch over to this aspect ratio on both the projectors, where are the chances that everything is going to look good as these things zoom in and out and, you know, yeah, they're, they're they're shift up and down, down left, mm -hmm. right. So, so I am assuming that those kinds of gifts you would be throwing out the window if you try to do a stack. So... So there's all, all sorts of different kinds of considerations, but, but yeah, first, again, you know, it's just, one of I overlaid my NZ seven and my RS 2100 with a quick little, like three minute jobber. And it was surprising with content, how much brighter it was with those two. And it wasn't awful when you got to the outsides, it wasn't lined up anymore, but that's two different vendors even. And if and that wasn't even the 2100, I think you meant to say the 12,000, right? The LS twelve thousand and the JVC R S twelve hundred, so they're not even the same oh, vendor, yeah. and it was still it was still pretty cool. Well, it's um, a fifty percent yeah. light increase. Yeah, yeah. so I, it wasn't. It wasn't. I don't know that I would say it was usable, but I also didn't spend like a real long time lining it up, and I didn't have two of the same models. It would be interesting with like you're saying with two of the same models to see what you could do. Right. Um, 
but they, really sorry, they make that really software line that for a reason too on the other hand so if you really want to do pixel peeping yeah i expect it to soften up the picture actually what happens is the center looks sharp and then it gets a little fuzzy yeah. at the edges is what your best case scenario is yes so, yep it's all interesting stuff to think about plus i like to think that you know i i don't want to just build this room for now i hope and expect future technology to get brighter, cheaper, brighter, cheaper, brighter, cheaper. And that's also one of the reasons why I have three dedicated uh, amp circuits at the front of the room. Maybe tiles will be there someday and they're going to be drawing a decent amount of electricity. Well, I have three 20 amps sitting at the front of the room waiting. That was actually something else I did for this room. I ran a 100 amp panel for the room. I feel like I could probably actually fill a couple podcasts now that I think about it. This is ridiculous. Um, this. But the, but the idea behind it is I just, you know, I'd rather, what's the old Wayne Gretzky quote? Uh, you want to skate to where the puck's going to be at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, shoot, especially if it takes you a couple of years to finish your room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, the stupid base array thing, I didn't plan for that. Now that's all the rave. Mm -hmm. I don't say this. I mean, I say the stupid in the most loving way possible. So. <laughs> And, and not only that, for screen sizes, didn't you say, Jonathan, you th what was it? Was it a 550 or 650 you threw on a 224-inch screen outside watching what? The 5040 threw on a 240-inch screen outdoors with a streetlight, and everybody was raving about how good it looked. So the 5040 is right up there with the LS12000 as far as brightness. It's pretty comparable. Now, so granted, I, that's a solid screen, right? Or is that? It was an acoustic transparent. Yes. But it's... But it's not it's also not vinyl i mean it's cloth so i guess it would be acoustic transparent if you consider it that way it wasn't a vinyl screen i don't yeah, know the, what the gain would be i mean and this is all you know like you make all sorts of different you know like we were talking about earlier with the D, D character in the stats it's like how good is your hdr gonna be in that type of situation utter crap clearly right mm -hmm. so and, and i realized that <laughs> but you don't have a direct ab reference so it's very difficult to yes for yes. yourself to establish that you're gonna think it looks great yeah and mm -hmm. it's gonna look in uh, in all of this oh man the movie that did it to me it was it made me so happy the year was 2017 the month was october i was sitting in the dolby prime theater um in north casey barrywood and uh, Barry Wood 24. It was back when they still had the JBL speakers that you and I own now, Jonathan. I believe 2017, yeah. they hadn't swapped them out yet. And I was watching Blade Runner 2049 with my brother. And I freaking loved that movie. And for whatever reason, there was this one scene in the movie where it just hit me. I was like, this feels so purely cinematic. And movies can still make me feel something. And I wanted that feeling back so badly. And that is going to be the first movie I watch when this movie is done. Just, uh, just, I just love the fact that, you know, I'm sure there's some people that hate that movie and that's fine, but I just love the fact that the art forms, you know, still does something for me and yes. that, you know, I have a hobby in service of that. Yes. I have the same kind of story. That picture back there is brave. That's the first yes. time I went to a Dolby. I don't remember who all was there, but the Kansas city group went to go watch that because it was the first movie in Dolby Atmos at the AMC prime theater. And they had a Dolby representative there and it's, it, you know, stoked up that whole emotion that you're talking about. Like, this is really cool. Do technology. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, get you into the hobby even deeper. Should we answer some of these questions? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure we got a list. Oh, that's not bad. There's no, there's actually very few. Oh. <laughs> that's why we <laughs> just keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's hard to get a word in edgewide, right? I like I have like diarrhea of the mouth. I think they're problems. enamored with your story is what it is. <laughs> okay. So, Jonathan, if you see any more questions, just start. I, I was kind of watching as we were going. I didn't see any any questions per se. Normally, we have a whole bunch of like people asking just, you know, hobby questions. You know, you know, no, there were here on the thing. So that's mm -hmm. that's what kind of thing we were kind of looking for uh, to answer here. But we got a few. So Herbert asks question. I have the HTP one with dual base management and the software ran me $400 Black Friday. Would me getting a DSP and running Rue make any difference? Yes. Yeah, that that's like an, an addition to thing, right? It's not one or the other. Um, I don't really like what Room EQ does with my low end frequency. I'm not, I've never been a fan of it uh, with what it and how it handles it. So he has I mean, HTTP one that has Dirac, doesn't it? 
Does it? Yeah, he's taught. That's what he's talking about. Okay. But Di even Dirac, I'm not a huge fan of with the low frequency. I don't. I'm not a. To be fair, you guys are also like you know Rumi Q software off the off the device uh, standard. Have you ever been enamored with one? I I haven't been. No. I'm with I'm with Ryan on that because you remember our 2014 auto EQ comparison. It was like rolling a dice. What are you getting? You don't know unless you measure it. So I I stand with the other guys here saying you probably do need REW to or Omni mic or some sort of calibrated mic to figure out if it's doing what it's supposed to do. Well, even then, what it'll end up happening a lot of times is it'll just totally neuter your low frequency for whatever reason. That's what always happened with my room is I know I'm flat down to nine at insane volumes and I'd fall off at like above 20 for whatever reason with Dirac. I don't I don't know why. I always said that my room is where Dirac goes to die. So no idea what it was doing. Um I think everybody should measure their room, whether they use room EQ or not, they really should independently measure using REW or OmniMic and see what exactly is going on and then compare that to a post measurement of whatever RE room EQ does to your room and see what happens, right? Maybe you're losing all of your low end frequency. Maybe you're, it's amazing. I don't know, but I can you bet if you're able to have multiple calibrations where you can flip back and forth between them they're probably going to be different yeah it's weird because you can even accidentally you know become accustomed to a defect and think that that's yep. what the right thing was all along and you yep. wouldn't even know it nope well and it's not just frequency response either there's phase delays and there's mm -hmm. interactions crossover points that the auto eq stuff can get wrong doesn't have to but can and and with the calibrated mic you can just verify what it's doing I'm going to share my screen for just a second, and I want to talk about what I mentioned just a second ago with that with that 2014 auto EQ comparison. Share a screen, share a screen. Here we go. All right, tell me if you can see the, the screenshot here. Okay, so this is small spacing. It's 2 dB it? spacing. But this is these are flagships Jonathan. from different companies. Jonathan, zoom yes. in. Zoom in. Zoom in? Yeah. I already did. That's as, that's as big as I can get. Oh, okay. I mean, if I go bigger, it, like, oh, it was going off the screen. There it goes. I can get one bigger. There you go. Okay. So can you see that this is not normal yep. spacing? It's 2 dB spacing, but to kind of show what was going on. So we had a Yamaha flagship receiver. We had a Sherboard 7, 972 with trend off. We had a Pioneer, not flagship, but I think it was one of the higher end ones. We had a cheap Onkyo. We had a Dirac. We had a Denon flagship, and we had an Anthem mid-high tier. And so we did auto EQ. We set them up, I'll show you in a second. We set this all up with drum stands. So the mic positions were identical for everyone. We we did this as objectively as you possibly could. We did it like the day before the meet and we did all these calibrations and this was the system turnout. This is old, it's 2014 timeframe, so it's not recent. But this was the auto EQ outcome from those receivers. So, I mean, if you have this much disparity between these results, which one did your which one did your auto EQ do? You know what I mean? Like you don't know what you're getting. This one had a huge hump at 30 hertz. This one had a big drop at 20 hertz. I mean, what this one is nice and flat. The red one, you know, like which which. And I and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. It's not necessarily that like, hey, look, the red one looks like it's a pretty good response. The red one was Dirac. Derek might be an exception, but a lot of these things have mass manufactured mics and those mics come off an assembly line and they have a plus or minus 2.5 dB tolerance. In the case of Odyssey, all of them have some sort of tolerance. So that's a 5 yeah. dB swing that's allowed by manufacturing tolerances of these generic mics. So if you have a 5 dB drop on your mic at 50 hertz and the next mic off the line, you know, is 5 dB higher, that's a big difference. So, you know, the calibrated mic helps you figure out what you're listening to or what you're what you're getting. Uh, anyway, that's just something to, to kind of like talk about a little bit. Here's something with the more typical 5 dB spacing. It looks a little bit, you know, cleaner, more uniform, but it, the same thing still applies. It's, it's the exact same graph, just with different, uh, spacing on the side. So you could see it easier. So, so each of these audio cues, they did not make a reference. Um, and, and here, this is something interesting too. This is when I took these things and I manually offset them. Let me go back to show you what it looked like before I manually offset them in the software because this because I you couldn't hardly make heads or tails of it the way it originally came out calibrated. So let me go back a page. How about it? 
back one page. Okay, so I think the results were at 195. And just for clarity here, this is a near field mic measurement of the speaker that we used to kind of give you a concept here. This was the drums down setup we had so that the mics were exactly placed in the same position for every one of these tests to be quite clear in the photo bucket watermarks on all these things, sorry. But you can see like we were trying to do this very objectively where everything had the exact same opportunity. Mic position one, two, three, four, five. That's how we did it. And that's where we sat after they were all done the next day. So this is how they came out after the after the results. This was set to negative 12 on the AVR and just play with the results that the auto EQ came out with. You can see this is 5 dB spacing again. There is a 20 dB swing on this thing from, you know, this lowest one's kind of at a 45 dB range and this top one's at a 75 dB range. So that's, that's you know, 30 dB just in the average sound level. And then not to mention the different frequency response that you're getting in here. So so anyway, all that to say, what are you getting with your audio EQ unless you, unless you measure it yourself and determine it? Stop screen. All right. Next question. Atma's question, four versus six. Is six ceiling worth it over four? We get this question a lot. Well, yeah, I we think answered this last week even. Yeah, it depends yeah. on your seating and how much you hate money. <laughs> yeah, that's um, and for in my room, for example, I'm doing a a nine one six or if you want to call the middle for the subwoofers four, but I'm also doing some you know transducers or whatever. But for the for the ceiling, having three rows, um, probably uh, that's why it probably made sense for me. Although I think one of the things we even talked about last week, you know, it's partially you know a content mixing issue too. If I'm mm -hmm. if I is is the issue where you have these situations where um the panning isn't necessarily ideal because of the fact that the signal that's literally baked into the soundtrack um isn't usually four six unfortunately unless i'm misremembering that unless it's objects well yeah, depending there's some on the device. That i think they corrected us last week there's some that are basically recorded in um two channels like they're flattened and mm. so if you have a four channel ceiling, it expands to both and you get stereo imaging between them. But if you have a six, it just leaves it in this in the middle one. And so that was one of the one of the complaints about having six is you don't you end up using one third of your speakers if you have six. Potentially. Yeah. Would love to hear more about infrasonic bass, multi sub not required. Is it true only one sub capable of playing infrasonic is required? Also, what gain is required? depends on the sub <laughs> and the and room it depends and on the sub. boundary knolls and modes and all that kind of stuff no you need more than one sub generally speaking and i i don't really subscribe to the fact that you're you're not able to and he doesn't mention this but that you're not able to locate a sub yeah sure you can't necessarily hear it but with your other senses you're going to be able to find it typically through vibration of whatever's going on on the surfaces I think it depends on the frequency and if your room has distortions or vibrations or that kind of thing. And proximity to the driver. If you're a foot away, you're going to feel the direction because mm -hmm. the driver cone creates acoustic energy on your pant leg. I mean, maybe if it was centered, but if it was off in a corner, I feel like you're going to be able to localize it potentially. So I, I've played around with this a little bit in my room. I think the THX, like if you're not going real loud to where the speaker starts doing harmonic distortions or where the wall starts vibrating or stuff, you can pick it up in that way. It's like you pick a low volume and you play like a 60 hertz test tone. Good luck telling what direction. Yeah, sure. yeah. But which what, which one of us three plays at a low volume? That's that's part of it. Right? So and I'm you're not crossed over at 60 either, Jonathan. I'm not. I'm crossed over at 90. Yeah. But that to me is non-directional. So long as I don't have, yeah. so long as I don't play them. Let, let me rephrase this a little bit. Any sub, as you start getting towards its upper limits of SP output, starts making harmonic distortions. And those harmonic distortions are second order, third order, fourth order, fifth order, that kind of thing. They are above the frequency of the fundamental sine wave sweep. So if you're playing a 60 hertz tone, but you crank that sub up to 11, now you got harmonics that are going higher, like chords on a piano. Mm -hmm. you're, you're playing beyond that note. Those higher notes are higher above the, the 60 hertz. So now you're starting to hear direction on the harmonics. So there's that. There's a bunch of different variables with this, but it 
really it's going to come down to your room. I mean, yeah, in a perfect situation, in a perfect scenario, you shouldn't be able to do it at a lower frequency unless you're starting to push SPLs like Jonathan said. But no room is perfect, and I can almost guarantee that if you push it hard enough, you're going to be able to localize it because of the room. Next question. When incorporating two 24-inch ported subwoofers in a 17 by 8 by 19 room, so I'm guessing the 8 is the height, what position would be ideal? I was thinking of placing both subs at the front sides facing each other in the corner. You so he's probably me. talking about like my room, how mine are opposite each other and they face each other. You, you got to measure. You got to measure. I, I don't have the knowledge. There's people that would know how to answer this without, you know, like they have programs that will do it to even determine this, but I don't have yeah, that knowledge of measuring. I think programs are fine, but they can only give you an estimate. It's like talking to some of the guys that I know in the industry, it's almost always at least slightly different or decently different than what the software tells you. Um, you can't take all of the room components into software unless you're really getting into high level simulation. So you're just going to have to measure. I don't know that the ideal position is going to be at the front, not facing towards you and having them face each other. I don't know that I would necessarily do that mine's that way but that was because it was that was the only option i really had without putting them in the room anybody else no i mean it with ported subs for sure the frequency response can change as you change it 90 degrees with sealed subs it doesn't change nearly as much in my experience measuring but I, I, there's no way I could begin to tell you which way is going to be best to your room. We've been measuring at different people's room where one faces forward and one faces sideways and stuff. And that was better in like Ian's room when we measured that three months ago or something. So mm -hmm. it, it all, I mean, it really just depends on your boundaries, your whether they're concrete or whether it's just drywall, all that stuff plays into it. Where your main listening position is relative to this, those boundaries, the modes and nulls in the room. There's so much, there's so much variance. I can't, I can't answer that. Too many variables. Do y'all think Holoplot X1 speaker tech will make its way to home theater or stay with two channel concert venues? I don't even know what that is. Me That's either. like, for example, the brand they used in the sphere construction in Vegas. And so, um, on, and by the way, and I did get to go to the sphere for the U2 show back in the end of October. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I talked about it, I think briefly on the forum, actually like a sphere is like one of the worst shapes there is for a room like if you like take a decently sized sphere and you put like two speakers in there and you put an audience in there it, it just sounds awful and that was one of the best sounding large concerts i think i've heard uh, on the songs where they nailed the mixing just right it is a live show after all but um i was actually sufficiently impressed I would think that the it, you would see, I have no idea if it'll make it HT, but I ex, I would expect you to see at other concert venues, uh, if if for nothing else they developed that technology and they're not just going to stop with one venue. It's not a one off. You know they they've patented the stuff. They're going to want to roll it out elsewhere as well. It'll simply be a tool or a vendor that people go to, and as people go to them, then it'll simply show up in the marketplace. And if they see success from there, they'll continue going. I know in the Sphere case, for example, they do plan on building more venues like that elsewhere if it looks like they continue to see the success they've seen so far with the one in Vegas. Is that like a Dirac art, basically? Is it doing active noise cancellation with the speakers, or what is the technology baseline? <laughs> Honestly, I only briefly read up on it, but it's kind of like it uh, a line array, a line array approach. Except for line arrays, I've always been very much vertical stripe, and this is more three hundred and sixty in its approach and how it goes about doing mm -hmm. things. Hmm. I won't yeah, pretend to know anything about that. Uh, well, let's get rid of that one. How far above the floor to the bottom of your screen is ideal? So your feet don't get in the way when you recline. So you That's don't see the other like. person top of the other person's head from the front row is another one, right? Yeah. And so they and there are calculators for that. That's so, usually under, the most common one. Yeah. So what ends what you usually want is just to find out what keeps the other person's head at from touching the bottom of the screen as you're looking at it from the from the second row. It tends to 
be all about a second or third row that you're trying to take into consideration with, I'm assuming with that question. And so without knowing um, stuff like your riser height and uh, how far away the screen is from you, it variables like that change the answer to the question. So that's and how why far you, the second row is from the first row, even exactly. Yeah. So, so that's why you you need to have a calculator because as you change one variable, the other one also changes. Or another variable is going to be where front row's eye position is in the screen because there is a recommended level for eye position. I typically like a third of the way up, but others are like halfway or whatever suits your fancy. But that's also going to dictate the position of the screen. There's a lot of variables in that. All right. Acoustic treatment, what do you recommend? Acoustic, GIC, et cetera. You guys have any recommendations? We typically build them ourselves. Um, usually, yeah, like some of those companies, it's tricky because they try to also, if they can, you know, uh, they want to package other services with them as well sometimes. And sometimes it becomes a better value add if you stack those things a little bit. So, but if you're just trying to ask, you know, like a build quality off the shelf kind of thing, so long as they have proper tested measurements, published uh, published results, and then a price attached to the item, then I would simply go for the one that says it does what it does for the cheaper price and be, get on with it. Yeah, they have an NRC rating that you can look <clears throat> at. And if the company is legitimate, that can be a good comparison value to look at. Noise reduction coefficient, I think it stands for. GIC, for what it's worth, a lot of people recommend because it's inexpensive uh, as far as these different companies go, and they make a quality product. So that name's not that a one gets recommended a lot. Do you think laying a subwoofer on its side would be bad for it? No. Oh, well, yeah. The only extreme example of that is a uh, driver sag in some situations, but you, but the fact that it's on its side in and of itself doesn't really matter. Potentially a plate amp might play into that, but not really. I mean, not really. You should have no problem. It's a circular driver. So I wouldn't have an issue with that either. Whenever I listen to Dolby Atmos music through Tidal, it plays in AAC 22.05 kilohertz and sounds terrible. All their music plays via FLAC or MQA and sounds great. Any ideas? What's the Tidal. device? What's the device that you're playing Tidal off of, right? Mm -hmm. So, like for example, if you're playing it through, like say, an Apple TV 4K, all of that gets you know converted to PCM through all the channels, correct? If he's using AAC, isn't that Apple audio codec? So it's got to be an Apple device, I would think, as a source. True. And I All don't the, think Apple audio codec sounds bad on mine, so I'm not sure no. where he's coming from with that. You may Although want to try and do this blind. And something to point out is that FLAC or MQA as a container means nothing, right? Because I could re-encode a horrific in mastering of a song and make put it into a FLAC container, and it would sound terrible. So all those are containers and it doesn't necessarily mean that anything is going to sound better than something else. And a lot of times in the audiophile community, these have a subjective bias associated with them. And people can think, oh, just because I'm listening to FLAC or MQA, and MQA was actually in a lot of circles deemed to be a hoax and title, I think is moving away from it, um, that they think it sounds better. When in all actuality, it's all it is is a container. So remember not to just think oh because it's flak versus aac that it sounds better you really need to do these as blind comparisons otherwise you allow your subjective bias and your subconscious to really color what you think sounds better or worse i'm planning to upgrade my yamaha rx v 2085 to anthem mrx 1140 speakers 8000 f 504 C Atmos, dual SVS PB3000s, RP500M. Is it going to be a significant upgrade? I would say it'll probably sound different. If Go you back uh, 15 minutes into our auto EQ discussion. That's why it'll sound different. <laughs> yeah. If you turn off EQ between those good between those two receivers and you carefully level match, good luck telling the difference. So yeah. roll the dice. I I'm not one that thinks, and I, I say that 
kind of tongue in cheek because I have an expensive processor, but I'm not one that thinks you have to have an expensive processor to get um, equ equitable sound, especially if you do manual EQ or if you're willing to dig into it a little bit. I lie at the extreme of that. I mean, I've got a considerably expensive processor and I don't even reuse room EQ. So it's going to come down to room EQ and what it does to the room. You should always buy an AVR or pre based on the feature set and, and, things that it has in it that you're going to utilize and not because you think that you're going to get a significant auditory upgrade because of the components like the DAC yep. or amp or what have you. Yeah. We've talked about it before and we'll just reiterate it real quickly. A lot of these measurements on these, even just base level uh, processors have gotten well past what human ears have capability here. So when you read a distortion number of like 0.05 THD, um, distortion on a lot of these mainstream $300 processes, for instance, that is, um, that is literally hundreds of a thousandth of a percent of distortion. And so you cannot hear that, especially when your speaker that you're using is playing three, four or 5% distortion. As you turn it up, that tiny little bit of distortion, the receiver adds is immaterial. So like you can go and look at ASR reviews and you can get an idea of what the Synad scores are, how they perform with the frequency response, um, all that kind of stuff. And then put all that in the box that you realize this is extremely expensive $20,000 bench equipment that your ears are not at that level of. Um, Gene from uh, Audioholics once said, and there's a thread, he did a Yamaha review that he thinks about 70 Synad store scores where most humans stop hearing. And maybe if you had some sort of golden elite audiophile with very, very like, careful test patterns and he's listening ab 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 maybe he can get up to an 80 sitting on score type thing but most of us just are going to be more towards that 70 end so when you see these process products and they're advertising like hey 100 C db synad that's good enough it's, it's now, i understand that enough. sometimes people are going to want to have it just for the psychology of it of knowing that they have something and what they're hearing is how it should hear i get that um, i just encourage people not to buy based on the premise that they think they're going to hear something that's different yeah mm -hmm. and You're not only that okay go ahead Chirpy. well i was also going to say uh, just the type of even the room it would take to properly um, um hear something like that in in like a uh, like certain like even like for example say like a noise test or whatever the threshold of how quiet your room would need to be is oh, yes, yeah like, it's it's ridiculous like yes. it's like you could literally like the second you turn on your projector you can cut another 25 off a you're lot right. of those numbers you're absolutely right that's a really good point so there's a different feature set, obviously, and a different EQ process. But what we're saying there, man, is that um, you know, you're sort of rolling the dice as which one you prefer based on the bundled mic that it comes with or what it does in your room based and then, on you know, 20 to 30 dB swings we saw in the different process. And then which run you get of it, because it's going to vary even with the same EQ, like mm -hmm. which, how it's going to sound one run versus the next based on what it determines to be the best output. What is going to be the largest difference between the image quality of my gaming PC with the capture card and Mad VR will put out versus the actual Mad VR Envy? Well, first off, the the source is coming in is a lot more plug and it's more about convenience and plug and play and options. So, right now there is some differences because the home theater PC crowd has access to some of the things that are not in the HDR tone mapping capabilities of MB right now. A big part of that is because Mad VR uses the home theater PC communities of that software kind of as a beta test program. There's a lot of very intelligent people that provide a lot of feedback to Matthias. So there's some features in there that the NB does not have. So potentially there is some differences, but as Chirpy said, the biggest difference between the two just pertaining to HDR is plug and play and the ability for Envy to do not just ripped content, but any content coming into it. Now, there's a bunch of other capabilities outside of Envy or not outside of Envy, but outside of tone mapping that Envy also has access to that the home theater PC software does not. But we don't need to go into that because I don't think that's the question you were asking. Jonathan, have you heard anything more about OmniMic V3? 
No, I haven't, but I will reach out to Parts Express and ask if um, Dayton Audio, in, in fact, and ask if they what the deal is, because they were supposed to come out in September and we're now in November. I haven't looked real recently, and they go out and see if there's if it's there now. I assume as by you asking the question, it's not. For as much as we push them up, they better send us some samples. <laughs> I, I'm pushing it because I like it. I already have one. Well, not the three. Omni Mike V3. Nope, they don't have it yet. So I'll ask and I'll get and I'll bring it up in a future podcast. Good stuff. Ryan and Jonathan, do you offer remote calibration for your home theater? Ryan does. That's I his do. business. I'm happy to help you as much as I can. So if you got any questions, Tito, hit me up. I don't know. Do I have access to those banners? I don't even know what banner he uses all the time. I think he's it's used to asking Michael to take care of that. Yeah, I am. And now I'm <laughs> sitting here having. Yeah. That. Where uh, is that? Just send an email or um, send a message. Fill out this form and let us know. That's your Midwest AV one. You want you want your ace. Yeah, but it's auto. it's gonna come to me. It doesn't matter. Oh, it comes to me. Don't it's all the it. same inbox. It's all the same. About the LS twelve thousand. Oh! How good are the black levels? Jonathan, are they Kira Plasma? No. Kira Plasma, no. <laughs> Actually, Kira Plasma Blacks is better than a lot to this day. <laughs> yeah, I don't think any projector blacks that I've seen. Maybe your Christie, Ryan, that you've seen. I haven't seen a Christie, but I've never seen a projector that does plasma yeah. blacks. I mean, you Not have to realize blacks. you have to realize that you know a, a plasma, you turn it on, the screen doesn't have to start with white. It it so um like I was literally displaying a, some video games with my daughter last night on an old pioneer plasma and it looked great. honestly astonishingly astonishingly great and like so i was like i even asked my daughter I was like what do you think of the picture quality she's like i think it looks great and so i was like i and my wife was like standing off to the side and she made an observation that i completely forgot about it's like it looks exactly the same from the side as it does from the front i was like yeah, that was sort of an ace in the hole back then. Nowadays, you have like X amount of brightness drop off for even some of the best stuff. Those yeah. just the way the technology worked. Um, just the biggest problem was like, you know, the thickness kind of heavy and it just it ran kind of hot and just sucked juice power, like yeah. sucked juice like no tomorrow. Oh, so, we had a plasma in our living room upstairs for about a year before it died. And it it would grow about 600 watts just being on. And you feel the yeah. heat when you walk by it. And the thing is, it'll draw that no matter what it's displaying. Yeah. Or no, more. no, no. That's not quite. That's not quite right. If it's a full bright, it goes. Screen. It uses more yeah. if it's full of white. Yeah. 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 I've still so, got a Panasonic plasma ST60 up in my guest bedroom. They look really good, man. They do. It's like we. It's like we. Uh, OLED now, I think, might have surpassed it. I. Yes, it I, I think I can yes. say it did. But I think we took a step back when plasma started fading away, and there wasn't. Yeah. You know, early OLED or before OLED, like it's like, wait a before minute. Before OLED, yeah. the first LC, yeah, the, the the early LCDs. The only reason why they awful. beat plasma was just it was all on the thickness of the display and and brightness. Not and, it, it, not only it, that, a big part of it was that people were scared of image burn in and retention. Yeah, that was a big one too. And and not only that, but you also have to remember that it's always the same problem where it's like, who cares how good the black levels are when you're looking at the TVs and Best Buy and Costco? It's just like nothing but pure light raining down on you. So it's it's and plasmas. In order for their black levels to look decent, you did have to have a little bit of a darkened room. Otherwise, um, mm -hmm. they had sort of a you know they give off a little bit of a grayish cast if you had like direct sunlight hitting them kind of thing. So. But it was it was that kind of stuff that got LCD's foot in the door, not necessarily being, you know, observably better because they really weren't for the longest time. Nope. People just got scared of them. And I think they were really expensive to manufacture. So the answer to that previous question was no, there's no projector that has maybe the Eclipse that has a plasma level black. So so you've seen it. Do you agree with that? Is the Eclipse there or not? The eclipse is there, but you have to have a f like no light in the room, none. Otherwise, it's it doesn't matter. Like it was bad enough that the guy running the room had taped off every light. There was no light at all in the room, and all, and all the people in the front row have to wear black shirts. <laughs> he was worried about people's shirt colors and yeah. and stuff like that. I'm dead serious. Like it's 
he was worried about the lights inside of Envy coming through fan vents and stuff. That's how <laughs> insane it was. So do you guys, I feel like there's almost something voodoo about like the OLED. I'm looking at a C2 42 inch OLED as my computer monitor. And if you watch like that Las Vegas 4K HDR scene or something, it's almost like it's doing something magical. The black looks blacker than black somehow. And it may be just the reflective surface or something, but it's like, it's like inky black. Like sometimes a, like some of those demonstration videos, it almost looks like the object is floating in space. Like there's nothing there at all. A big None more black. Our perspective of black is skewed. Mm -hmm. Like we're used to seeing light hitting it and we don't, we're not used to seeing it black. Like if you put a Vanna black object in there, that's actually black mm -hmm. with no light reflection back, it would be even if you put it next to like an, o an OLED, it would make that look gray. I would imagine. So, yeah, well, I, I guess what I'm saying is there's something magical because even with this like room lighting on right now with this level, if I go watch that demo, that is like black, black, yeah. black, inky black. It looks like somehow the TV is doing that. But if you had a projector like that, it's going to look cr like crap with this yeah. much room lighting. So, yeah, I hear what you're saying there. Ryan, Chirpy, are you doing any floor decoupling in your room? If so, how are you handling the change in floor height with a door and exterior room? Okay, um, give me two seconds. I will pop up an image. I know exactly. Um, I actually sort of talked about, I can give the answer based off some images I actually posted in your thread, Ryan. So just a second. Um, how do I present? Share screen, window. Okay. And then I'll pop that. And then Jonathan, if you'll be kind enough. Okay, so I have a, uh, this sandwich is indicative of the majority of my basement. So I have a, f a floating floor everywhere in my basement and in the theater room. And it starts with a product at the bottom here. It, that's basically a type of dimpled plastic. You roll this out flat. And then when it rolls out flat, you can then put a floor under layman underneath it. So... I, for the rest of my basement, had tongue and groove treated ply or OSB. Either one, you know, um, they sell both. Uh, and then I have an insulation pad that's about just yay thick over here. And then whatever you want on top of it, right? So I have something kind of like that. Um, so you know, there is no actually change in floor height with the door and the exterior room because what I did was I just simply used the tongue and groove treated ply or OSBs part of this. As it crosses over from one room to the other, I just made sure that uh, I had uh, the thickness match, right? So I used that part of the layer to have them seam up. Turns out uh, I was actually the nail it almost perfectly as the uh, as the door uh, jam on the theater room side then crosses over to uh, the theater lobby side. And so it only shares... Uh, just the smallest amount, like there's literally like an air gap that's about two inches and it only shares like one piece of that sandwich between them. So I get a fairly decent break between the two while at the same time seaming that height together. So hopefully that made sense. Great yeah, answer. Sure. Practical. <clears throat> oh, uh, so somebody was asking uh, if you run electrical through PVC and let's say you run it like say parallel to your, to like cat six or something like that. Will that help you at all? And like, no, it does nothing for interference basically is a, is the short answer for that. But that's a good question. I, I, I asked my question self the same question once upon a time was just why I now know the answer. Currently at 5.1.4 using one SB 3000. Now should I go duals or use that money and go to the SVS SB Ultra 16 and use that as a single rooms 10 by 10 with seven and a half foot ceilings. I sit seven feet from the front stage. Thoughts? SB 3000, is that a 13 inch driver? I think. Pulling it up. 13 inch, 800 watt RMS. So we talked about this before. Generally, two 13. 212s will equal a 15, 213s will equal 16, that type of ratio. So if you're happy with the output of the SB3000, you're just like, this is enough for me, and you just want to have more room smoothing so, smoothing so that every seat is good, then you're probably done. Get another SB3000 uh, and be done. If you're like, ah, I need more output, the second sub may or may not help you there. 
And so you probably want to go to an SB Ultra 16 and get its uh, a sibling later, you know, get a second one later. Or switch ranks and go to a different company. You have other options besides SVS. Uh, they're kind of they're kind of getting a little pricey these days, perhaps. They are. So, you know, they're a good product. I'm not saying they're not, but they are they are getting kind of big for the britches in my opinion on the price point. So you might yep. start looking at something like a JTR if you want to, to go really extreme or maybe a Rhythmic or some of the other GS, uh, GSG audio if you're willing to do some do-it-yourself. You have other options besides SVS is the bottom yep. line. I agree everything there. Ryan, you got anything? Uh, no, honestly. I mean, but to your point that there are... Uh, I like the fact that you put in two different categories. Like, you know, like if, if it feels like that you're feeling like if you've having a lot of suck out moments uh, in your base, you know, that might, you know, be, you know, indicative of a, of a, of a null where, you know, you would rather have multiple subs and and you might be even find it even better with like, like, like what's an RSL speed woofer times four kind of thing. Right. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's just one of those situations where, I, I almost wish, I almost feel like it's so easy to answer a lot of these questions with um, uh, how much money do you have for the mic first before you go after this other problem, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's uh, that's probably my extra two cents on that one. Mm-hmm. Staying on subs, plate or external amp? External amp. Since he's asking, he probably has the choice and yeah, absolutely external amp for my opinion as well. It's yeah, it's it's easier to put it in a service location. Um, it's easier to swap out. It's it's uh, more reliable. It's more term. reliable, yeah. And you're not putting a giant hole in the cell. <laughs> mm-hmm. Should I run room calibration software to all recommended positions or just a few? I can speak to Odyssey on this, but I'll let Ryan speak to Storm or Chirpy speak to whatever he's familiar with. Odyssey is just averaging them. So it's, it's developing the distances and the SPL from the first seat, and then it's just averaging the frequency responses. So you do want to do all eight because your averages will be more accurate. Fair enough on the Odyssey stuff. What do you guys got for other ones? Anything for other other options? Honestly, I think it uh, depends no. on how many seats you care about. But I guess that's more about how many where the positions actually are. You would just spread them out more depending on that. I can tell you, if you watch my little Arendelle video that I put out last week, you'll see that if you just take a single frequency response, there can be a little bit of variation between it. But if you start averaging them, it really solids, it really makes it solid. So by even if you only have one seat you care about, if you do eight spots, you're gonna really see my that in and you can was, move it you can move it six inches per. Yeah, yeah, you know? you're exactly right. The more positions helps and it tightens up the average because you're measuring and giving it more data points to create the average from right if you're only comparing or wanting one seat you just tighten the measurement positions is all you're doing and lean your chair back and put it in that yeah. resting position where your ears are going to be in a seat forward position where you're like lean forward to listen and kind of average out that one seat in a little bubble right because it's it's taking that bubble of sound or if you always listen in one particular position do it in that one particular position and just move it around kind of around where your head would be but more, more measurements is definitely better. Don't just do one. If you guys were building Home Theater 2024, how many min channels and what must have features? Direct, Dolby Vision, RO3D, HDMI 2.1, HEOS, et cetera. It's Heos. easy to run wires. It's easy to run wires. Yeah. And then he, he goes on to say, also brands, I was thinking of maybe a Denon A1H or something. At 6K or below. Thoughts? What would you guys, what are your must haves if you needed to buy equipment or do your room again? It sounds like he's wanting to go towards the top end of the spectrum. So um, I don't, I don't personally care about Oro 3D, although if it has it, it's just one more feature to have. Uh, I don't care about Auto EQ terribly much so far in my experience. So that's my opinion there. Dolby Vision. You probably do want, but most any receiver, even the $300 ones will pass that. So you don't have to worry about that one. HDMI 2.1 is good if you're a gamer. And if you're not, you may not care. Or HEOS is better. fantastic. I love HEOS. I use it all the time. Um, as far as channel count, we kind of talked about that earlier. 11 channels, 13 channels. That's probably pretty sufficient. I like front wide, so I'd recommend 13. 15 is 
not as much of an upgrade as I hoped it would be, personally speaking. Um, so, you know, that's where I'm at. That's where my head's at. Where do you guys think? Yeah, I'm going to stick with my answer. That's it's uh, it's easy to run wires, and then you know you're covered, right? So um, I just I just ended up with a, a nine one six simply because of the fact that I had three rows. Like if I had two rows or if I had one row, I don't you know I wouldn't honestly bother with the six at this point. Um, and uh, outside of that, if uh, I can't, th the the hard part is right now. It's like Dolby just basically. You know, more or less squashed um, the other ones as far as like trying to make other room layouts work uh, you know, in any appreciable way with like the, the, the software isn't there. And by that, I mean the movies and the music and that kind of stuff. So the part I'm curious about, maybe I can tack onto this question. The part that has me most excited right now um, isn't even video related. It's, it's, it's spatial audio. Like that's where I, 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 I'm listening more and more than I am watching because of that. And I don't know that the, it, this all changes all that much taking that into, uh, into account. Like has anybody else read any of the rules that they're asking for, uh, uh spatial audio mixing at this point? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So like, like, I feel like that's the one big thing that's changed recently as far as like, you know, like, like the trend off is how many years old already. And as far as like the audio, uh, channel counts and stuff like that, that hasn't really moved a whole lot since they, them bringing the base array stuff in, that might be one of the features that I wish that I could have that I would put on this list because I think it's pretty cool stuff, but it's so com it's so complicated for the amount of extra so the things to consider about this is just food for thought with the channels and stuff is if you start talking about active speakers all the way around, it gets out of control very, very fast. Um, like in it was contemplated in my room before, when I was talking to Ascendo. And it would have been in the neighborhood of 70 channels to do everything in active because you're running different channels. You're moving the crossover from the speaker back to typically something like a storm or a turn off. And I'm running a channel for the top end, a channel for the low end on every single speaker, multiple subs. And it just got really big, really fast. Now, Trinov does have things where you can add like, I think you go from 32 to 48 channels and you could go past that. Um, so it is getting bigger. What I do see increasing quite a bit on a lot of the newer AVRs and pre's, and this is something that would be one of my first things to make sure was happening is having over two active sub outs on an AVR or pre mm -hmm. having at least four would be my suggestion if you're going to do it and spend some money. I feel like at some point, it doesn't matter how many channels they add. There's a limit to how much like the diminishing return sets in pretty dang hard. In yeah. my opinion. So, you know, like when you're talking 70 channels and I think you're talking about active crossover networks. Yes. Probably, right? yes. So it's not exactly. really 70 speakers. No, absolutely. And how many way speakers or something. Is it two way? Is it three way? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I mean, like, all right, consider in this room, right? Where are you not getting coverage from a speaker that adding another one here or here is really going to do much? Because also consider that they image between each other, right? It's not like you don't hear a gap right here because you're hearing both of those blend or all six of them blend. So that's the dimension returns I'm talking about. This is 15 channels. There, you're, It's kind of hard to find a spot you don't hear audio coming from. <laughs> so... I, that's I think the, it's, that's it to me. It's going to have to be a change in technology and move in a direction more of what art is doing or what yeah. you guys were talking about, the hollow PT or whatever they were called speakers, where you're dealing with wave cancellation and the speakers actually interacting with each other and not being source points for the listener. So it's going to have to change in how the speaker is utilized instead of just being, hey, I want to hear where an audio object is coming from it's more i think to make the room a more uniform experience in something like art or waveforming or something along those lines but to go back to actually answer the question again my big thing would be my go-to would have four sub outs because i think having more subs you can't have enough subs you can have more enough speakers but you can't have enough subs what are your guys' thoughts on actually what you would want as a necessity? 
Well, I want to do that test with the four subs at Sheldon's house in December or January, like we talked about, because I think that will be enlightening. Where he's got he's got four stacks of 18s in each corner. And so I want to see what that if we wire them up as one sub each, four sub outs, and you get the corner loaded base. I'm just curious how that'll that'll play out. Cause that would kind of answer the equation. I've never I have four sub outs on mine. I still just use two. Um I haven't relocated my subs in that Yeah, sense. but aren't you using a mini dsp yeah but they're both i mean it's just two two channels one bank is five and one bank is three. Oh, okay so you mm. the ones up front aren't delayed at all they are the ones on the front are running directly off the receiver the ones in the rear are running off the mini dsp so that i can add delay to it to be able to do the negative delay for the butt kickers but it's still at the end of the day these three subs are getting identical signal and those five subs are getting identical signal so as far as so I guess I'm answering your question as far as four sub outs I depends on how your arrangement's set up if you have four disparate locations y yeah you'd want it because you want some way to set uh, timing delays impulse response mm -hmm. settings which affects phase and everything else between your four subs if you're running them stacked on top of each other or right next to each other it's probably not as critical to do a yeah. separate sub out for each one that's what it amounts to. Okay. Mic drop. So, got that one. Sorry, just cleaning up. That's fine. When you guys do side speakers for 7.1, do you put them just in front of everyone's ears so it's not blasting people that are on the outside seats or just right in line and who cares about them? Right in line is worst for me. Just in front or slightly behind, I would pick it, it simply because that's not, you know, right in line is not what surround content is, is supposed to be. It's supposed to be adding to the sound field most of the time. Now, of course, there are some times where it's supposed to be the main event for what it's ever having in that one channel. But most of the time, it's an augmented part of the soundtrack or an augmented part of the soundtrack. Right. So that's why I feel like that kind of positioning is what they tend to recommend as opposed to something that's just directly line of sight. Now, it 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 helps a little bit with I, I think, especially with some kinds of uh, uh, music that gets mixed and surround, maybe, you know, it can it can make it feel more immediate in those sides. But I've honestly never liked it like. It feels um too obvious right and i'm like always backing the levels down more whenever they're directly in line with my speakers but maybe it's different for what other people have tried i have an opinion on this but go ahead ryan i've been leading nope. the conversation too many times go ahead so you can see on mine they're slightly behind my position so here's my seating and then there's the there move the spit the right way there's the speaker uh, I have the exact same thoughts as Chirpy, that if it's directly in line, uh, A, the person that's closest to it in a traditional speaker gets blasted, and the people that are further away don't. So it's a really obnoxious to have it right at 90 degrees. It's right in your ear. I don't like it in front of the seats, and I'll tell you exactly why. Some older games that are like 5.1, they expect the sound to be behind you a little bit because with the old 5.1 standard, the speakers were not definitely not in front of you. So the game is mapping out, I've and I've experimented with this quite a lot, like if you play an Xbox titles or anything else. The game is mapping out that audio to basically be kind of in a here position when it's coming from the rear speakers. And if your speaker is here, as you're moving your character around in that 360 degree space and the audio is panning, it's not right. So, so some of my friends that have said, oh, rear surrounds right in front of you is better. And then you, with a 7.1, you put the 7.1, the back, back surrounds in the rear position. That's fine until you get to a hard-coded 5.1 game and all of a sudden your character doesn't pan right. So if you don't game, it probably doesn't matter. Maybe you might even like in front, but if you game, it's a not, it's a non-starter. My thoughts are going to be don't put them directly in line. If they're going to be directly in line, have them at least above slightly so that they're not the person next to you, if there's somebody sitting next to you, isn't blocking the sound wave from getting to your ears. Why no? Why does no one talk about JL Audio Fathom subs? Those are beauties, but they're overpriced and underperforming yeah. for the price. Yep. And then I'll layer this one in. Why does nobody talk about M and K subs? So we'll talk about both of those because they're not that good. <laughs> they used to be they used to be darlings once upon a time yeah. and then they just sort of sat still i think is what happened with the m and k's yeah 
Yeah, that's all right. Would you guys agree that there's a lot of manufacturers out there that just it's all brand recognition and not anything to do with actual function? Well, isn't it that that's the funny thing about being a business, right? If you can make sales at a certain price point and, you know, and get away with it, um, who's to say that's the wrong choice for the business? Oh, I'm not so. saying that's the wrong choice at all. I'm, oh, from yeah. From a consumer's point of view. Oh, from a consumer's point of view, it's it's a different equation altogether. But I understand, I understand the viewpoint. So, but yeah. I still remember a subwoofer shootout on the East Coast that we went to, uh, Sheldon and I. Somebody brought an M&K sub there that he was real happy with before the shootout, and there was a bunch of Internet Direct darlings like the JTR and the Seton Submersive and stuff like that. Some do-it-yourself 18s, uh, LMS 5400 drivers, for instance. The guy that had the M&K sub literally rolled it down the hill at the end of the meet because he was so mad at it, like rolled it down the backyard. It's like, oh, I'm getting rid of this thing. Man. That's, I don't think, I can't do that's that. Bad. That's just mean. <laughs> I'd hit it with a hammer. I don't want it to have a slow death. Got to put it out of its misery. Well, doesn't just plug it into the wall. At least have some fun fun with it. Yeah. <laughs> What's your guys' opinion on the new Sony AZ3000ES? I think this is their AVRs. Yeah, the the, uh, the ESs have always been like they're they're slightly higher end. It's their version of a uh, like like an old school Pioneer Elite. Mm -hmm. I don't I have much chance. opinion because I don't have. I've never really used them. Traditionally, Sony hasn't had very good AVRs, so make sure you get read some reviews on it before you buy that one. That's all I know, and I haven't read reviews, so I can't speak to it either. But I just know history. History says they have an uphill battle. All right, another sub yeah. question. What about funk audio? You guys never. Oh, about I think I think that, however, isn't completely true. Shoot, weren't they? Um, did they make a showing at M Wave? I can't remember. Funk's good stuff. No. No. They weren't okay. Never mind. Okay. Funk is basically like a upgraded do-it-yourself type setup. They use off-the-shelf drivers most of the time, and they make super pretty cabinets, and you pay for it. Yeah, it's it's kind of like uh, if you combine stereo integrity with Salk Sound. Yeah, there, there's nothing bad to say. I mean, they're like literally you can find you can find all kind of measurements from the enthusiast guys on AVS forum. They're, they're using drivers that you can buy yourself. So they're not proprietary. They're not watered down drivers. They're top end drivers and they're top end cabinets and top end amps. And that's good stuff. So Beefy says, I have dual push pull MK sub. It's brilliant. It's not a powerhouse, but for music, which is a big deal for me, it's ideal. All the yeah, power to you. We don't want to, I shouldn't have said what I said, but, um, so, so like, here's where it goes, you know, back to like one of the, our very, very first shootouts, Jonathan was when mm -hmm. we had uh, the sub shootout. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking my SVS sub over there and I would not have built, bought that sub for any money at all. If I had mm -hmm. heard it in your room first, in my room, mm -hmm. it was kicking so much, but it wasn't Absolutely even funny. True. And, and so the moral of the story is, um, like it, depending on your usage, um, I feel like it would help if some people don't look at this one's better, this one's worse as much as what's the appropriate tool for the situation and my expectation to get out of it. Because, mm -hmm. um, it may very well be depending on the room that this M and K sub is in, like if it's, you know, if it's on a second floor and, it, and it's, you know, it's in a room that's not crazy huge or anything like that. And it just so happens that you're only sitting in one seat that matters for you and you lucked into a good frequency range, well, maybe it was dialed in really well, uh, then, you know, spending a whole bunch more just makes it louder. It's, yeah. um, so there's that. Well, not only yeah i guess i guess that's true i was gonna say something that i'm not <laughs> you don't want to extend this <laughs> well so there i mean there's truth there's truth to both sides of this yeah. i'm not going to discount anything uh ryan said because chirpy said because when i went to his theater he had that thing front loaded and we were all amazed that a single 12 was doing what it was doing in his room in my room trying to keep up with the jtr it bottomed out so hard it felt like somebody was hitting a sledgehammer on a tent peg at one clanked point. so clanked. like it was not happy yeah. So, so there's the difference, right? When you're, when you're, when it's in its own environment and it's set up in a nice optimized spot and maybe some luck involved, maybe some diligence involved, it was doing its work. But if you try to compare it to something like a JTR 4000 ULF, 
Now, There's no comparison, no matter the room. This is where I diverge. MK has a history in music production, and I think what you mean is uh, that means that it's going to be good at music. I disagree. Yeah. I think it's if you put this thing next to like an Ascendo, a JTR, a Perlison, a well a done, rhythmic, like a well done yes. DIY sub. They're different in tiers. Music, they're either going to keep up with it or slaughter it. Um, I think one thing that people need to be very careful of is that you need to make sure that you understand that. And I'm not trying to put anything negative or anything out there, but you may think something sounds very, very good in your space now, but you don't know what you don't know, right? So what happens if you take that M and K and then you put it right next to say a DIY sub, and then you do a double blind test. This is really the only way to do it. Otherwise, you're going to have subjectivity bias in, introduced here. Then you can decide which one is better. But it's it, I just ask that people be very careful about saying this something meets the criteria of something else just because it's doing, and I'm not downplaying what your thoughts are, but just because you think it's doing well in your room, right? Because what you don't know you don't know. And we see mm -hmm. this all the time with shows with like Mad VR and HDR reproduction and even with the sub shootouts and Jonathan and Chirpy, I'm sure you guys have seen this all the time with your guys' shootouts that like with the M and K guy coming out and was very happy with it. And then it goes against all these other subs and it just kind of falls apart. So just be conscious that what you don't know. You don't know, and in, this, in ignorance is bliss. And and it being, a, it, it's a little bit nebulous also too when some of these uh, companies uh, market themselves to being in different type of production situations, right? Like I remember if I had a book every time B&W was bragging about that they were Abbey Road Studios, right? It's because those speakers were gifted to them and maybe they get used sometimes for certain mixing and maybe they're not. Um, but they keep different, uh, some of those, uh, production studios, some of those, those environments, they don't have just one set of speakers too. Like they, they want to see what their mix sounds like on different speakers. So it's not even just, oh, this is the best one. Like there's a famous pair of Yamaha bookshelves that, that, um, people would mix with in the eighties simply because they weren't that great of a speaker. But for whatever reason, if you could get your mix to sound good on those, it transferred really well to everything else. So when something's associated with production, there can be a lot of different reasons for that. And it's not always automatically, oh, this is the best thing that you can get. Not saying the M&K is bad. Just... Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. You can say they're bad for the money. I think that's fair. <laughs> and there goes Jonathan. This thing's terrible. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. <laughs> me, 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 I mean, me. How much? How much is it? How much I'm seeing like four paper? grand for a 12 inch driver. When oh, I just... oh I... no! Wow. Are you sure? Here's a 15 for six thousand. If you prefer that. Ooh. And here's a 12 for five thousand. So yeah, that's what I'm seeing on Google. Okay. Oh, mm, yeah. Yeah. That's. That's interesting. He says, I understand this. I'm just saying it's definitely not total crap. Yeah. I can get behind that. And I'm not saying it's a bad sub. Yeah. It's probably great. Not sub. A, it's not a six and a half inch Spark O Matic in the back of your old Camaro. And it could be a fantastic sub, Beefy. And this is the last thing I'll say it could be a fantastic sub in your room. And the only thing, as Chirpy said earlier, that getting a bigger driver or a bigger sub would do is make it louder. So it just depends. There's a lot of variables that come with this. All right. I started my last one and I'm not starting anymore. <laughs> we did that one. Who is the Ascendo distributor dealer in the US and is anyone using mass loaded vinyl? Well, I'm an Ascendo dealer. The distributor is um, Sutherland Distribution. I think he's in on the West Coast and they have a warehouse down South. Um, if you are interested in any Ascendo, shoot me a message. They make a great product. That's what my whole theater is going to be, is Ascendo. Ignore. I love Martin Logan, but this is all changing. Is anyone uses used mass-loaded vinyl? Um, I like it as a floor decoupling product uh, for like 
uh, for those types of situations, it's kind of a pain in the butt to work with on the wall. Honestly, there's other things that I probably prefer to, to work with, to be perfectly honest. It works ish. It's, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. You, I wouldn't use it from a, I don't think of it as a sound proofing product, although it can do that if installed correctly a little bit, but I consider it more of a decoupling product. So my favorite situations for it are on a floor. On like a second floor, I should say. Yeah. Wouldn't sometimes when you're looking to blend sub speakers, can you have a better full, full range speakers up front to create that? So I think he's talking about like a blended experience. Is it better if you're using subs with full range towers? I'd say it really doesn't matter. I don't think you're going to notice a difference. What are your guys' thoughts? It's well, so dependent I, on setup and everything. Yeah, I mean, oh, what's kind, what's considered sure. a full range speaker too, right? I mean, like if it's a speaker that gives up at ninety or a hundred hertz, then yeah, probably. But if I think but, what he's talking about is if you took something like the JTR two fifteens or something, would that be better than having like a something with the same high frequency and mid bass drivers, but maybe had like tens for the subs or eights or sixes. I don't think so. Cause my favorite JTR speaker is the two twelve, and it's not full range. It's yeah. like what? 60 Hertz crossover or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It, it's all about your implementation of it, man. I, I don't I'm think a fan it really of, matters. I'm a fan of separation of concerns. So, um, I, yeah, I feel like you, you spend a lot of, ex if you're, if, you would be spending a lot of extra coin for for a part of the frequency for a lot of speakers, especially those JTR ones, where they're based mostly getting thrown away, and not for nothing. We talk about this a lot. Those lower frequencies. Uh, it used to be that oh no, the the sub placement doesn't matter. Gosh, it feels like it matters just as much or more than anything else. The more we dig into it these days, mm -hmm. so putting the you know those lower crossover points somewhere else and being able to, especially with multiple subs, just feels like more of a win all around with me. And I have to save the extra money and put it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Your cost increases exponentially when you try and put the bigger drivers into your LCRs. Talking about subwoofer for shootout, what were the results of the shootout at M-Wave? And Jonathan, I think there was a comment about the Klipsch RP-16 placing fairly high for both music and movies. I It must have been uh, someone else that commented on it because I didn't even really get to participate in that. I was like sitting in the back watching kind of what was going on, and but I didn't really get to vote or, or think, you know, like listen to the whole thing. So, Ryan, you were in there. Did you? What was your take? I think the so, Klipsch did place well, but I don't. It did. It was shocking how varied people's likes were. Um, one of the problems with that test, though, was the subs weren't in the same position. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it was people liked different things when they sat in different parts of the room. So I encouraged people to move around. Um, and it was really, I think, eye opening for people to figure out. And they took everyone did move and people's likes and dislikes still were heavily varied. Uh, the Klipsch RP-16 did place fairly well. Now, that's the only experience I have with it. So take that for what it is. I'm not talking negatively or positively about it. It's just I don't have any firsthand really experience in my own room or have a significant amount of time spent with it. Um, but where was it placed in the room? Do you recall? Was it kind of centered or corner or where it was? It was nothing was next to a wall. We were using the middle of the wall about a third of the way in. Um, it was center left. If you're looking at the subwoofers, so it wasn't all the way on the end, but it wasn't all the way in the middle. Mm -hmm. We'll do it again. I'm going to try and put them on a some type of lazy Susan or movable system that we can move them around. We you should try to grab a frequency response sweep of all those next year, too, because those rooms were large enough. The boundary interaction should have been they're, they're there, but they should have been minimized compared to like a regular home theater room because the room oh, is so large. For yeah, sure. Way more so. What you need is you need like four of each model. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. RTJ came out with a new 18. 
They came out with a new 18. RTJ is ans- is ask he's asking is RTJ the higher tier of JTR and the answer is yes. RTJ is the installer brand of JTR. Um that's that's basically it. I wouldn't say it's higher tier. It's, it's probably using pretty much the same amp and so forth. I'm not sure if the driver is the exact same or not. Do you know, Michael? Not Michael. Michael that, Ryan, that's probably. a force of habit. Yeah, do you do you know? I don't know if it's the same driver. <clears throat> It is. When you got your captivators, did it have the same exact driver as your RS? It's the same driver. Okay. As far as I'm aware, maybe it's different now. But it's a great sub. The main advantage of the RTJ sub 18 is that it uses an external amplifier instead of a plate amp. So it's smaller. But they're both speaker power amps. Yes. Yeah. Which are still really phenomenal amp. Top notch amps. Phenomenal amp. I, s- I know I said that was going to be the last question, but. I think there's two more, and this one's aimed at Jonathan. Really oh, digging no. your LS12000 versus NZ7 series, currently looking at projectors. If you and everyone else had to sum up your opinion on those two, what would it be? You also, know anyone else would consider the USTs. I'm going to be quiet on this one and let uh, Chirpy answer it, because he saw the two compared to my room in the last couple of weeks. All right. Yeah, sure. Uh, I've seen them at your room, Jonathan. I saw them at InWave. I saw them at somebody else's house, and I saw one of them um not compared directly to the L12000 but lots of other situations here's the thing um the way i look at it is almost everything on them is comparable enough to me for a lot of the check boxes right you know like like um, uh, average uh light uh, adl or whatever for you know when it's at the mid level brightness on screen and above your your color accuracy your resolution, your contrast in those areas when you have that kind of content on screen, flip a coin. I don't care. Maybe actually a lot of the times uh, it ever so slightly nudged towards the LS12000 um, to have just a slightly more punchy look. Now, some people might think that punchy look, you know, is, it's kind of like the difference between a Samsung mobile display and an Apple display, right? So it'll be a little bit on how you feel about that. Of course, the black levels on the NZ7000 looked obviously better. Here's the thing, though. When I say obviously better, I say, yeah, they. I can tell the difference between the two. I don't think either of them are that great, not compared to, like, say, an OLED or whatever. So I would say, clearly, the NZ7 is the winner, and you're both still losers. So, so I think, you know, they're both really great-looking projectors in, in that sense. The part that bums me out is I just can't get past the motion on the NZ series. Um, it's once you, it's one, it was one of those once you see it, you can't unsee it type moments for me. Um, I game a little bit. I don't do a whole lot of first person shooter stuff, so it's not as bad as if I did that kind of stuff. Um, but I see the tearing in it, even with, uh, like certain motion settings on the JVC turned on, I feel like, uh, like the minimal setting, uh, I think it's, 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 it's like, we'll it's call not it that. good L1. The, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, Low it's not, it's mode. not great. Yeah. So, but on the, on the Epson, it, 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 it was a lot better. So the way I would look at it is, um, if you game a, even a moderate amount, or if you watch certain type of material and watch for like panning across screens or whatever, I would seriously consider the LS12000. If you're a cinematic guy watching the expanse on the sci-fi channel, the NZ7 is your projector. So um, that would be my summary option of those two. Not for nothing, um, even with the price drop, there is a, a fairly big penalty to pay, you know, getting those slightly deeper blacks though. So, and, and as I understand it, Jonathan, even with the new firmware update, it doesn't really move the needle. And most of the thread, the other people who've downloaded the new firmware update for the NZ series have found that it, it's just, it's tweaking a few things in a few places. I know Michael posted a video. I watched it. It's, there are some edge cases where you can see a little bit of a difference, but it's not, I don't think for most people so far, it is not setting the world on fire. So. Yeah, I, d- I downloaded it that first night, and I think my opinion stands exactly as it was before with the JVC. I've used it a little bit since then. You guys hit it all for me. So last question, and this is because there was another Ascendo question earlier. Ryan, what are your thoughts on the smaller Ascendo speaker? Worth it, or would you jump to the 10 or to the 12? 
This is a tough question and it depends yeah. on your use case. So Ascendo designs their speakers to be very similarly voiced. The main differentiator here is going to be output. Output is dictated by what you're doing with your room and what you're, how you listen, right? So how far away your listening position is, all kinds of different stuff. They all, though, are very similar in their frequency response. They're all going to fall off much sooner than what you would think with a traditional speaker, but Jeffrey designs it that way to minimize distortion and excursion. So it's all going to come down to what you want to do with the speaker, what your room design choice is. Um, I typically would recommend nothing smaller than a 10 for your LCRs, and then you could do sixes for your surrounds. A lot of people will typically do something for their front, say 10, 12, or 15, and they'll step down a speaker for their surrounds and their tops. That's typically what they're what a lot of people do. Um, do you have to do that? Absolutely not. But that's what I've seen a lot. If you have any more questions, hit me up. And that goes for anybody that's looking for stuff. I promise I don't bite. Um, Michael does get a cut of this for whatever comes through. So just reach out to us. Even if you don't get anything, I'm happy to answer any questions. And if I don't know, I can refer you to one of these ugly fellows and we can get you taken care of. The Ascendo 6, I have a question for you. Yeah. Generically speaking, generally speaking, a six inch driver can't do reference levels in a mm -hmm. moderate home theater size. Mm -hmm. What's what's the efficiency rating on that six? Or do we know, or can we say so that it certainly does or doesn't? I think his maximum output is 113 for sustain and once, maybe that was the 10, hold on. I don't remember if he's got these published or not. There it is. I found it. 113 continuous, 117. And 117 for burst. Yeah. So it's still significant. They get on up there. Um, that's how they're designed. It's not going to be able to do it at the low frequencies like you would get down to 60. It'll get probably down to 70 or 80 with room gain. Um, I don't believe this. I don't believe this. We have to prove it out. You getting what? any of these, the sixes? says it has a 25 millimeter soft dome and that Arendelle I just measured was a 28 millimeter soft dome and it couldn't go over about 85 or 90 sustained. So how's this little 25 going to do more than that? I'd like to see the graphs. So those, let me get them Spock. Where are you, where are you seeing that? Oh, I just went to a vendor site that was called the sound council that oh, has the specs. On. Woofer was 6.5 inch tweeter, one inch soft dome. What's going on with his website? That's freaking out. Ah. Like that that's throwing my red flag up that's all so, so. passive passive six on wall does he have the spinoramas on here he does yes he does so all of his speakers are independently measured um so let me see if i can share this screen we can go through this together uh, screen share screen <laughs> i said on the back channel we got to end this it's three and a half hours and then i know i was making fun of me because i was excited. a young man <laughs> <laughs> oh so this he has all of the his speakers measured by an independent lab um so this is all of the information that you guys are looking at it's available on the ascendo website you can just google ascendo speakers and all of the measurement data is available here and i want to say yeah but look at those spl levels are measuring that at. that's 90 db 85 db I, there was a compression test somewhere in here at least so who's me. gonna buy them and test i want to know i'm not paying that well <laughs> there's your compression what the heck is happening at fifteen thousand hertz That compression chart doesn't even make sense. It's talk. It's a distortion related, maybe or something. Go back up a little bit. This is better. Well, there. I mean, if that's the valid data. That thing's looking like it's up at 115-ish. So on yeah, the chart, the red line, it's the max passed. 
See that on the 20,000? Wait a minute, that's 200 hertz. Where's our 20,000 hertz? Mm. Wait a minute, what's going on here? That is 20 hertz on a speaker like that? Don't have it. How far down is it? By the no, way? it's that's at like 55 dB. Yeah. That's just what it... What, I can ask him for it. And that's just what it. Yeah. Something's fishy about that chart. Why are we looking at a, on a six and a half inch driver? Why do we care about three quarters of those frequencies on that chart? Give me the real data. <laughs> so I can get some and we can do a compression test on them. Put it on the list, man. Just more to do. More money to spend. No, no, no. That's what they always say on YouTube. It's all content. Except that's Michael's content. I don't have a YouTube channel. Oh, <laughs> man, that's true. <laughs> oh, well. For the rest of it, it's charity. Uh, Ezra, you reached out to me. Uh, just reach out again. I may have missed it. Or I responded to you and we just didn't connect. Um, who listens at reference? Everybody in this room. <laughs> Depending on the on the material, but yeah, pretty yeah. much. So ah, you, to get especially uh, 100 hertz and below. Come on. Yeah. So if you guys need to reach out, Ezra, just fill that out or send a message to Ryan at ascendav.net. And I may have just missed you or I responded and it went to your junk mail or something. Who knows? So I think this is where we wrap it up. This is one of our longer streams, three and a half hours. I blame That's a bladder buster and a half. <laughs> I checks in chirpy. the mail, Chirpy. Thanks for joining us tonight. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if you send the check, it'll, you know, it'll get eaten up by the postage. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate having you on. Thanks for, thanks. No, thanks this was fun. Yeah, I, I feel like I've probably threw out half the content, but I feel like the stream was pretty long as it was. So mm -hmm. yeah, we can maybe do a deeper dive in a few of the subjects in the future, but that was plenty fine for now. And that was the wrong banner. That's the correct banner. But Chirpy, you were a people want to have you back. Yeah, multiple comments. I think you talk too much, but I think people appreciate all of the expertise you bring. Well, for well the things that you've gone through and experienced. I think well, that's I appreciate that. I'll see what I can do to try to eventually wear out my welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I wore wear out my welcome every day. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, kids. Well, I had fun. We're not closing it down. Don't leave just yet, but I'm going to oh, close oh, out. Oh. Thing, so. What? <laughs> no, I just meant like, don't just jump off because we got to close things out. But guys, oh, thanks no, for no, no, no. I'm going to end. I'm going to end it with a with a very Michael saying at the very end. I'll be like, have a blessed evening or something. Oh, yeah. But everybody, thanks for joining us. Three and a half hours. Still 120 people here. We'll be back next weekend. I think as long as I don't fall off a lift because I'm hanging Christmas lights next weekend. So hopefully everybody has a great week, great work week, and we'll see you all here again soon. Chirp, are you gonna come up with whatever? Oh no, not at all. No. You just all you all have a blessed evening, you know. And that's the great thing about this community, the fact that when we all connect with each other, build these relationships. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Michael. Yeah, um, reading off the sheet. Uh, no, all right, guys. Have all a right, good one. Thanks so much. See you next time. Bye, fellas.